This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beattie's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass' birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit civilwartrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. No, that's not fun. Riding for a job is fun. I would love to do yeah. that. Take them from the rear. Are we doing this? Or? Yeah. Ready? I'm going to mark her here. <laughs> All right. Uh, what do I do? You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. I am your co-host, licensed battlefield guide and historian Eric Lindblade. And as always, I am joined by my co-host, licensed guide and historian Jim Hessler. Jim, what's today's topic? Jim, wait a minute. Where am I? This isn't Getty's gear. What am I doing here? Eric. What? Are you done? No. Okay, because nobody's buying this. Yeah, no, probably not. Okay, so... Well, good here. while it lasted. Jim is not here, ladies and gentlemen, but Eric Lindblade from the <laughs> Battle of Gettysburg podcast is here, and uh, we are talking today about the 26th North Carolina. Um, also joining us in the studio is Six Questions Lens. Hello, Six Questions. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. I did it again. Which one are you? <laughs> I'm number five. Number five. There you are. Sorry. Sorry, Mikey. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. And uh, Eric, the producer, is over there in the corner as well. Hello, Eric, the producer. Hi. Hi. Okay, good. I was glad I didn't mess up on your mic because <laughs> I always feel bad. Like, you I, think I do it on purpose, but I don't. Because I yell at you. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, it's terrifying. It's Can like I be hurricane. Eric, the underproducer? <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. to differentiate us? Sure, yeah. It's going to get confusing. Well, I'll call you the blade. I'll just Fair be, enough. I can just be Eric, the Uber producer. Uber, Uber. I like that. Uber producer, Uber mensch. That's what he is. There we go. Um, and uh, Eric, yeah, you'll just be the blade from now on, or, or plain old blade. E- e- either way. We're uh, talking about the 26th North Carolina, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget to uh, like, share, subscribe, comment, review, all that stuff uh, there that helps us out very much. Um, and uh, that's, that's about it uh, for that stuff there. Uh, Eric, you are from North Carolina. This is your first time on the show. A lot of our listeners are your listeners, but for the sake of people who didn't know, there were two Gettysburg podcasts, uh, and they've only found ours first. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I have been a licensed guide here since 2016. Uh, done probably about 2,500 tours Good for so you. far on, on, in my guide career. I must say, um, I see you out on the battlefield Almost every day I'm out there at any time, like random times. Sometimes I've seen you more than once out there with a whole new group of people. Oh, yeah. You are a touring fool. I mean, you are constantly out there. Well, it's what pays the bills. So (laughs) there's that. But you like Uh, it. I do. Yeah. And and I think it's, you know, it's a great job, uh, you know, and certainly it's opened up a lot of opportunities for me that I probably would not have had. Otherwise, it would have been years later before I got to that point. Um, it's also what led myself and Jim to do our Gettysburg podcast. Um, so if you are a listener of this show and like this, you might like our show as well. So if you haven't listened to us, it's the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. I always tell people um, if you... Um because people, you know, well, I've talked about this with Jim on this show before, and, and now I'd like to get your take on it. People are often like, uh, so I was listening to the other Gettysburg Oh, yeah, podcast, I get know. that, too. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. And then they're like, yeah, I, you know, I, oh, oh, you know, and I go, and I'm like, you can listen to both of them. Like, we're not mm-hmm. competing for the same audience at the same time no. in this, you know, in one little city. It's worldwide, and people listen on their own time, mm-hmm. on their own schedule. So there's no competition. And I always tell people that you can listen to that one if you want, like, 
serious, like real hard hitting analysis of different things. And um, if you want to listen to an idiot talk to smarter people, then listen to our show. <laughs> well, as I, I've told people, they're, they're two different shows. Yeah, they are. So it's like, yes, we're talking about the same topic, but it's different shows. It's a different way. And, and I think that's where, you know, I guess the squashes whatever like rivalry or if, if people are fermenting that there is no rivalry folks. yeah they uh, like, just, this is another thing that Jim and I have talked about I think the listeners want there to be a rivalry or think there should be a rivalry yeah. uh, but there there hasn't been I mean we it's the only time I'm reminded that there's another Gettysburg podcast is when Jim has been on the show or when someone comes up to me and says, so I was listening to the other Gettysburg podcast. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's it. I'm, I'm so focused on doing my own thing. Like, I can't think of everything else that's out there. Right. You can't. And nobody can do that because then you'd be like, well, I'm not even going to bother trying. Well, this is why we can't have nice things. This is, this is exactly <laughs> This is right. exactly why we can't have nice things. Because the people, the, well, the, the, the general public ruins everything. Except for our audiences. Yes. Yes. Our audiences are wonderful. It's everybody else that's yeah. lousy. It's, <laughs> so. it's only the members of the audience that think that we should hate each other. Those are the lousy yeah, ones. Yeah, they're lousy. Yeah. Yeah. So That's not nice, ladies and gentlemen. Why would you want that? Why would you want that? I yeah. know who you are. And, you know who you and are. And it's like, I mean, if, if anything... Like, you know, we're going to be like two rival gangs. Like, you know, it's right, our block. Jetson. You know, like I, I break out my switchblade. When you're, yeah. when like, you're hey. a battle up at Gettysburg podcast listener, yeah. you're a bet. He's, yeah. It's like, look, it was very clear. You guys have the south side of town. <laughs> we have the west side. You come into the turf, you're going to get cut. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. Simple. And you know what I think we should do, whether it be this year or next, it might be too much to plan for this year already but uh, you know how we did a live show at the Farnsworth house mm-hmm. in the winter time the two of us should do a live show not the two of us the two shows mm-hmm. should do a live show together somewhere I like that idea that would be fun and then what we could do is like you know how like when we did the Farnsworth house show we had a little game show like a trivia show <laughs> instead of that uh, for the entertainment part of the show um, we can do like jello wrestling between a staunch fan of your show and a staunch fan of my show mm. who won't listen to either to the other show yeah. and then you know made the best Jello wrestler win. I like that idea. Of course, I have not heard from any of our listeners that they won't listen to your show. Well, I have heard that some of your listeners won't listen to our show. I've read it on Facebook and yeah. Hey, so I'm not responsible <laughs> for those people. Like, I mean, no, yes, not. I, I am all re- I am responsible for every single listener we have. I, to um, be fair, I don't listen to either show. There you go. Eric's part of one and it, <laughs> No, that's good. And the yeah. only reason I listen to my show is because I have to edit the goddamn thing. But Honestly, I'm so sick of my voice. I will f- like when we release an episode, I will listen to it just yeah. kind of really quickly. And that's it. Yeah. Like, I don't think I've ever listened to a finished product of one of our episodes like, like more on than the drive. One, yeah. No, yeah I, I hear myself talk enough. Well, I don't there, need to do it when I'm like driving. Exactly. So. There are a few that I have listened to, though. One of them is the episode I did with Jim about the little bighorn mm-hmm. connections to Gettysburg. Uh, because I just I love I love listening to Jim talk about whatever he likes to talk about. Sickles, Custer, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I'm a. The Little Bighorn's my other favorite battle, mm-hmm. so I was like a pig and shit recording it and and listening to it is you know I do like to listen to that one every once in a while, but for the most part I cannot mm-hmm. listen to my own stuff. It's it drives me nuts. Yeah, it's the same thing as reading your own writing. Yes, like, yeah. it's just it's different. It is. So, it is different. You no, know, so I would say if anybody is so like they've dug their heels in. Seriously, stop. Yeah. Life is way too short for which Gettysburg podcast you, you like more. Absolutely. Like, if that's your big issue in life. Like, Get a life. Yeah, we're going to talk to somebody. Yeah. Get out of your mom's basement. Well, where else am I going to get No, not you. <laughs> I, was, I was talking about the listener that we're talking to. Oh, no. The hypothetical. Say, it's pretty cool down there, because you know, all I have to say is mom, and I get, like, pizza bagels. Cause, oh, you're, you're, like, you're like Cartman. Uh, yeah, well, you know, when oh. pizza's on a bagel, you can have pizza anytime. Right. Or meatloaf, right? Yeah, meatloaf, meatloaf yeah. Good too. Yeah. Yeah. Just meat, watch meat, meatloaf <laughs> Mondays are always great. So, um, all right, we've had fun. Now let's get on to some serious business. Yeah, because you're 20. not allowed to joke about the no. Civil War. You cannot you know joke that? when doing history. You know what? Yeah. Actually, that's probably why people don't listen. That's probably it. Because you made a joke once. Yes, we get the same thing. People are like, "How dare you talk about pro wrestling on a Civil War podcast?" Because heck, 
75,000 people here were a Confederate Army, and I guarantee you at least 60% of them love the king of sports, professional wrestling. <laughs> That's why we talk about it. That makes total sense, of course. Yeah. It's in their honor. It is. Yeah, it's their memory. And that I day. actually have an account of pro wrestling on the battlefield during the First World War. Really? That's for another show. Oh, that's but, interesting. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Pro wrestling. Pro wrestling, yes. We got professional wrestlers from Baltimore to come up for, to perform for the Camp Colt garrison here. So oh, Really? So it must mean Eisenhower's a pro wrestling fan. Oh, yeah. He must have loved it. Yeah. Well, good for him. But you can't love it now and love the Civil War at the same no, time. No, you, you cannot have fun during the Civil War. No. In no way. Shape no. or form. And I always make the argument, uh, like, uh, that came up one time before, and I was just like, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is depressing stuff to talk about. Yeah. And um, I'm going to joke, and I want people to, mm-hmm. to laugh, because it's not we're not laughing at the subject. We're laughing at ourselves or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, you can't talk about thousands of people being killed or maimed um, and that not affect you in some way. Right. You know, so uh, you got it. You got to do it with humor. Okay. Well, I've always said people that are, you know, first responders, military, anybody has a tough, stressful job Mm -hmm. often has a very dark sense of humor. You have to. Because otherwise, yeah, it's depressing. The Civil War is depressing, folks. Yeah. uh, Eric, you were in the army and uh, uh, I was. Yes, you were. And and didn't you guys joke about some pretty effed up stuff? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I, I grew up with people who were uh, EMTs yep. and, and I used to go to parties with them and they are the craziest people I've ever met. Mm-hmm. But you have to be. Yeah. You have to be. Other, and and I, I mean, crazy in a good way, like a fun way. Right. Um, and uh, but you have to be because otherwise, like, look at what you're dealing with. Like you would kill yeah. yourself if you didn't have a sense of humor about it. Yeah. No. And I think you have to find it. Also, humor is a way to connect with people. Yeah. Um, I think even on tours, I try to incorporate humor when I can. Um, there's some things you can joke about, some things you can't. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, what can't you joke about? Well, I try not to make fun of any individual oh, that gets uh, wounded here. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, what really That's hurts tasteless. me is when people make fun of Sickles for being wounded here. Right, right. What other American veteran would you make fun of, like, for losing a leg? No matter what you think about the guy, he still lost a leg Well, for didn't that kid on SNL make fun of Dan Crenshaw? Yeah, he did. He's yeah. a tool, too. He's a tool, too. So. Exactly. Uh, tools do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, especially when you've never gone off and put yourself at risk to lose an eye or exactly. a leg. So yes. I won't. Uh, Man, I'm yeah, glad I, I've never told those stories around you. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> what stories? What, what are you talking about? I can't tell them on here. No, no. But like, you mean our army stories? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, you've told me some pretty good ones. I haven't told you the best ones. Oh, well, I can handle the best ones. <laughs> Tell, please, please don't hold back. I love those stories. I love them because like, that's the type of stuff I like to joke about, But and you can't do that in no. civilized society. Well, there's certain things, I mean, you can make fun of their backgrounds, you can make fun of decisions they make, or right. you know, there's all kinds of stuff. But, but not wounding. At the end of the day, you don't want to make fun of people being wounded. Right. Um, you don't want to make fun of people losing their life. No. That's not a joke. And, and I think you look at, I would just say most of the people that argue, oh, you can't have any fun, read actual Civil War soldiers' letters. These guys are not angels, folks. No. They're not good church-going boys. They're having a good old time because they're 16 to 26-year-old males who are known to do really stupid stuff. Dude, so. I, I'm telling you, I, I, I won't go into the details here because it's very X-rated. But a friend of mine sent me a link to a, a Civil War letter that was on eBay. And I wrote back, this is a joke, right? And he goes, no, this is real. And I'm like, they talked that way back then? Mm-hmm. And and this was only a couple of years ago. And yeah. I've read that sex, uh, the sto- so- stories yeah. the soldiers wouldn't tell. I've read that. and But this was like, it was a, a soldier writing back to his cousin, who I'm assuming mm-hmm. was younger um, and, and not old enough yet. And and basically the cousin's telling him because like you know he's the only guy left in town and it's all these women, and so he's telling him about all of his conquests. Right. And the cousin's writing back. That's great that you did such and such with so and so and and mm-hmm. but like repeated what it was that they did. Yeah. I mean, I was like, wow, I didn't know they knew how to do that. <laughs> well, what people always have to do when you look at the letters, consider who the audience is. Yeah. If it's a letter to their mother or sister or wife. You're going to get a very different letter, even the one written on the same day, to a brother, right. a friend, right. or a dad. Right. And I mean, I have a, I have an account of a soldier seeing a prostitute in Richmond mm-hmm. during the war. 
There you go. That's history, folks. Did he? Uh, was that from a letter or a diary? It was from a letter. Uh, for, um, he to, wrote to his brother. That's what he did. And he had leave. He got to go to Richmond and horizontal you know, refreshments. Exactly. He found himself a nice, nice lady, and they had a wonderful time riding a Dutch gal. Or, you know, uh, or as they say, walking down to Tredegar. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> All right. Before we say something uh, completely reprehensible, let's get on to the subject at hand here, Eric. Uh, I couldn't think. I've always, I've honestly, for years, I've wanted to do an episode about the 26 mm-hmm. North Carolina, and I knew that it had to be you mm-hmm. to do it uh, because you've been working on a book about them for uh, 35 years. Yeah, and I'm 39. <laughs> so I started when I was four years old. Um, it was pretty cool. Uh huh. Um, it was a preschool assignment. I had nothing better to do, and still here I am. <laughs> then, yeah. So this is going to be like, how many volumes is this now? I mean, this is a lifetime of work. Uh, I mean, uh, well, right now, volume twenty-seven just takes you up through <laughs> August of eighteen sixty-one. Um, <laughs> so, Christ. what are you doing? A bio of every guy in the regiment? No, I don't want to give you an idea. Are you? <laughs> uh, I do have biographical information on everybody that served in twenty-six North Carolina. Are you putting it in your book? It'll be incorporated in some, but aspects. not everybody. Not everybody, but so. people of note. People of note, and I think also interesting cases. Sure, um, we have accounts of soldiers that commit suicide in the 26 North Carolina. We have accounts of soldiers that are injured um, by fumbling a weapon on their own. Mm. Um, we have a count of one soldier getting shot by another because he didn't give the right call sign to come into oh. the picket line. So you see all kinds of things that are part of a military experience that that was part of life for them, right? And so you do see that, and I try to incorporate that, and also try to focus on some other figures that maybe have not gotten as much attention or I find interesting. That's the that's the beauty of working on a book. You decide what you find interesting. And now, well, so what was it that drew you to them in particular? Well, where I grew up in, in North Carolina, you have what was, well, it's no longer called that, but it was the Atlantic North Carolina Railroad. Uh-huh. It ran from Moorhead City all the way, ultimately, to Raleigh, North Carolina. Well, during the Civil War, it's a Civil War era railroad. When the 26th North Carolina first sees their act, first action of the war, it's in my home county, hmm. where I first worked in the history field at Fort Macon was their first assignment. Okay, that's cool. Uh, also, being from North Carolina, you come to Gettysburg, guess what you're going to go see? You're going to go see yeah. the 26th North Carolina because... In many ways, the 26 represents North Carolina's sacrifice in the Civil War. Right, because they're not the only... No. And, and and now, why do you say that? That's an interesting... Why, why do you say that? I think they are... Any book that ever needs to talk about the horrors of Civil War combat, all you need to do is just mention the 24th Michigan and the 26th North Carolina. Right. I hate to say it, they are window dressing for horror. Yeah. And for me, they kind of become indicative. But to me, the story of the 26 isn't so much what they do here, but how do they rebuild? And how do they actually function here during the battle? Those are questions that haven't really been asked. And uh, well, so let's let's uh, let's get into them at the battle here. Okay. Um, they were re- very recently added to Lee's army. Yes. Uh, where were they before? So they had made a brief appearance in Lee's army during the Seven Days. Okay. So they will see action outside of Seven Pines at what was called King's Schoolhouse, and they'll be at Malvern Hill. In fact, they actually are one of the Confederate units that make it the furthest at Malvern Hill, which is funny because you don't get the arguments about that that you do at Cemetery Ridge. Mm. Nobody cares mm. who got the furthest at Malvern <laughs> Hill. They do care who gets the furthest here. Uh, but but they also they will see their first action in New, at the Battle of Newburn on March 14th, 1862. Which you wrote a book about. Uh, well, I wrote a book about... A little battle near Newburn. Oh, near Newburn. So, okay. so even more obscure. Okay. Um, so I <laughs> yeah. said, you know, Battle of Newburn is not obscure yeah. enough. I got to right. get really into the weeds. <laughs> it's like the Battle of Shrewd Farms. Yes, uh, which was actually bigger than the battle I wrote about. <laughs> um, so, so they they're one of the. Well, a lot of people often call the 26th North Carolina a Green Regiment. Yeah. Well, the regiment dates back to August of 1861. Just because they are not in the meat grinder that was Lee's army in 1862 doesn't mean they're not experienced. Um, And what you'll see actually here at Gettysburg is, on average, the rank and file, around 60% of them have two years of experience in the ranks. Okay. So this is so a, it's mostly this is veteran. Not green guys and now so. you uh, the one thing that uh, people seem people who know enough to know what the average size of a regiment was at the Battle of Gettysburg for both armies 
uh, are you know, their, their eyebrows go up when they hear that they were about 800 something men mm-hmm. when they came in. Why was that so big? Was it because were they in a garrison well, for a while or what? A couple things. Okay. Um, one, they have always been a very big regiment. By October of 1861, they numbered 1,200 men in the ranks. Wow. So think about in that period, you're supposed to be 1,000 guys. Right. They've got 200, 200 extra. more. Yeah. Uh, so that helps. Also, well, they, why did they have that many? Well, they were they became a very popular regiment. Uh, one, their first colonel was Zebulon Vance, okay. a very popular figure. At uh, one point in, after the Battle of Newburn, Vance got this very southern idea of forming a legion. So here at Gettysburg, you've heard of Cobb's Legion, you've right. heard of Hampton Legion. The idea is it's this mixed force of cavalry, infantry, and artillery, which sounds cool on paper, but administratively for an army yeah. is a nightmare. Right. So they say, all right, you artillery guys, go do your artillery thing. Your horsey guys, you go <laughs> do your thing. And for you guys that are just humping a rifle all day, you guys go to the infantry. Right. So that helped. Also, the regiment was very good at bringing in guys from the home counties. You will often see soldiers detached on leave, and they'll be told is while you're on your leave, try to get a couple guys to join up with you. Um, So they also miss out on battles like, well, most of the seven days. They also miss out on Second Manassas. Hmm. They miss out on Antietam. They miss out on Fredericksburg. They miss out on Chancellorsville. So if you look at a lot of North Carolina units that are comparable, so let's say a unit like the 23rd North Carolina or the 28th North Carolina, kind of right around that same era, look at the size of those units here at Gettysburg and their wartime experience, that of the 26th. Uh, the 26th will come in on July 1st of actually what I can gather about 904 men. Not that now. Perspective. Now, why why did you raise that number? Because I've always heard it was like eight mm-hmm. eight fifty five or something like that. Where'd you get nine oh four? There's a couple things. Okay. Um, on June thirtieth, they do a muster. You get paid uh-huh. when you do a muster. So you so everybody shows up. Raise your hand. Also, the twenty six immediately after has a number of guys writing about how many were in the ranks. So we do get a, a reference point, and often it's a little bit of confusion because often when officers talk about the size of the regiment. They are talking about the number of rifles right. in the regiment. So, Effective. So when I say we have 800 men, that means we got 800 guys with muskets right. here, not counting the, the roughly 50 officers, more or less, you'd see on the field. Mm-hmm. They don't really matter in terms of a fighting force. They're, their job's to lead. Right. They're not, they're actually throwing out lead. So that gets confusing. Also, there's a couple of works. Uh, one was George Underwood's History of the 26th North Carolina that was written in 1907. Okay wasn't even written by Underwood. It was actually written by John Lane, William Burguin, Henry's brother, as well as Thomas Curtin, who was a captain from Union Ca- County in the 26th. But they go with the 800 number. And then they'll say that we lose you know, X amount, and even the casualty numbers. What I found was actually the casualties have been undercounted for the 26th North Carolina. Really? As horrific as that sounds. Um, I placed their loss at Gettysburg at 742. Wow. Whoa. Now, where do you come up with that? So, a couple things. One, we do have the compiled service records of these soldiers. Okay. So, we can look at it there. Also, letters and diaries are a great way of telling who did what and when. Also, you had listed accounts of casualty lists throughout the South. Oh. And then you get into this weird figure where there's this guy that goes through the Gettysburg campaign, but he ends up in Gordonsville three weeks later, okay. being treated for a gunshot wound. Well, where did he get that gunshot wound? Mm-hmm. So you start to kind of piece these things together. And also in Lee's army, if you could show up at muster the next morning, you weren't wounded. Okay. Now you can have a bandage on your head. You can right. have a massive contusion on your leg from a shell. But if you're showing up the next morning, you're not wounded. Uh-huh. Lee did that on purpose. Um, a little bit of cooking the books here. Uh-huh. So really, if anything, I've long argued, if the 26th North Carolina is indicative of Lee's army, which it may or not be, because I've not done that research, Lee's casualties here might actually be underreported. Wow. So just kind of think, keep that in mind. Um, so. Which that would make sense. Yeah. I mean, you got to think about those those first day units that were then used on the third day. Um, you know, I mean, they they took more casualties on the third day like that's Yeah. You know, and uh, a lot of those guys were walking wounded like they yes, were they, they were put in the ranks with mm-hmm. bandages on or something like that. So they they were. Yeah, that's amazing. OK, so 
Uh, they're in Pettigrew's brigade. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are their sister regiments? So their sister regiments is the 11th North Carolina. You have the 26th. You have the 44th North Carolina, which is not here. They're actually detached guarding Hanover Junction. Then you have oh. the 47th North Carolina and the 52nd North Carolina. So if you think Pettigrew's brigade is big, they were down a regiment here. Mm. So, so uh, and is Pettigrew's whole brigade new to Lee's army or just the 26th? The 26th had their brief appearance re- right. there, uh, but the 11th, the 47th, the 44th, and the 52nd had not served in Lee's army until the Gettysburg campaign. Okay, so the, the so whole, they are all new, right. newer regiments, new so. and then quasi new, right? Um, so, uh, anything remarkable about their trek in on the 30th um, that mm-hmm. pertains to the 26th? Anything happen that? Well, it, it's great because if you read the letters and diaries, when these guys enter Pennsylvania, it's a great adventure for them. Uh, we actually have an account of Henry Burguin stopping in Charlestown, now West Virginia, to show them the gallows where John Brown was executed. <laughs> well, why is he showing them that? Because he was there as a cadet at VMI. Oh, cool. So he's telling them that story. Yeah. Um, and then as they're marching into Gettysburg, uh, they'll be moving towards Gettysburg on June 30th, which is kind of a forgotten aspect. We all just think, you know, John Buford shows up on July 1st, and then Henry Heath comes waltzing down the Chambersburg Pike. Well, no, we actually have confrontations among Buford's force at Fairfield against 52nd North Carolina, who is not on the march on June 30th. Mm-hmm. And we do get the point where the 26th and the rest of Pettigrew's brigade actually advances as far as Seminary Ridge. Yeah, um, We actually have an account from Sarah Broadhead that notes that the skirmishers made it all the way to the edge of town. Right, And then they see that kind of cloud of dust and they hear some noise. One soldier says they thought they heard a, a drum. Drum, yeah. Uh, what which, do you think that is? I think, it, you know, it wasn't uncommon to have little bands in towns and if you got your boys coming through it wouldn't be uncommon to see some you know local with a drum just beating it yeah for no reason yeah it's practicing and, maybe yeah or i mean yeah do we know did any of the local bands have a show that night maybe I don't he was know. warming up well i mean they'd probably be mad because it's going to get canceled due to confederates <laughs> um so they're probably mad but yeah probably so okay so he um so so they come in on the 30th go ahead so and what we have is pettigrew was under orders not to bring on a general engagement unless he can do so to an advantage mm-hmm. what we often hear is don't bring on a general engagement people always forget the rest of lee's directive what lee is saying is if there's a token force in front of you push it back right. don't let 50 guys mounted hold up an entire division right and what we're also seeing is pettigrew is doing the job that, frankly, Jeb Stewart's troopers should have been doing Mm -hmm. on June 30th. Um, So he's bringing wagons. They're looking for supplies. And people often say, well, the Confederates had already gone through Gettysburg. Well, Hill doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. Also, it's not inconceivable that locals might hide stuff and then bring it back out. So always follow up. So so to anybody out there thinking of looting a village anytime soon, (laughs) remember, always do a follow-up visit. Right, go back. Yeah, that's when they break out the good stuff. That's where they break out the silver. Yeah. Uh, So That's that's great advice. It's good life advice. Yeah, (laughs) that uh, is. So now when we have this moment, they hear all this noise. They see the cloud of dust emerging on the Emmitsburg Road, which today, one of the things that really throw people off you don't get the same sight lines they did no. in 1863. So Seminary Ridge looks a lot different today yeah. than it did in 1863. You would have been able to see directly out to the south of Gettysburg. Yep. So they see this. Pettigrew's orders are, if you don't know the size of the force, move back. He doesn't know the size of the force. He also hears that drum, hmm. which who typically has drums? Infantry. Infantry. So he does the prudent thing. He withdraws his force back to McPherson's Ridge. They wait. Up comes Buford's troopers. Pettigrew falls back to Hare's Ridge. Buford comes forward. At this point, Pettigrew's thinking, this is not local militia. No. They're not that brave. (laughs) They're not afraid of us. And the way they function, you can tell veteran troops on the battlefield, their body language, the Mm -hmm. way they conduct themselves. These guys know that. They eventually fall back almost all the way to Marsh Creek, where Pettigrew actually set up an ambush, hopefully to lull these horsemen in. Of course, they don't go for it. Right. That's the final key for Pettigrew going, yep, yeah. this is Army of the Potomac. Well, if you're Pettigrew, what do you do with that information? You it, report it up you the chain. You report it, yeah. He goes to Henry Heath. Reports it to Heath as he's explaining the situation. A.P. Hill shows up. Heath says to Hill, hey, 
you know, Pettigrew, tell General Hill what you just told me. And he tells it, and he says, I think lead element in the Army of the Potomac's in Gettysburg. And Hill goes, that's funny. I just came from Robert E. Lee's headquarters, and he had never mentioned anything about that. Uh-huh. Which, to me, is a very interesting little tidbit. Right. Because this is the afternoon of June 30th. We're getting an insight into what a corps commander is being told at Army headquarters, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, then, Pettigrew is thinking, well, gee, how do I convince this guy? Well, one of his staff officers was a captain by the name of Lewis Young. Lewis Young had been a writ part of Pettigrew's original brigade, which had been part of A.P. Hill's Light Division. Hmm. Well, when Pettigrew is wounded at Seven Pines, he's replaced by a young officer by the name of William Dorsey Pender. Uh-huh. Pender now is on upper division track. Division commander. Obviously a division commander here at Gettysburg. But Young had that experience of not only A.P. Hill, but with Dorsey Pender. So he brings Captain Young over, and Young says, you know, General Hill, you know me. You know my ability as an officer, and I'm telling you what General Pettigrew is saying is true. Still, Hill doesn't buy it. See, and that that's what gets me about that whole story, is that when he is presented by uh Young, or when he's uh, encountered by Young, mm-hmm. uh, or you know, brought Young is brought to him is what I'm trying to say. Right. God damn it! Uh, and uh, uh, and Hill still doesn't believe him. My question is, and and nobody knows this, of mm-hmm. course, but like I'm wondering, is it maybe Hill didn't have any respect for him, or is it that Hill was like, nah, you're just excited, uh, yeah. you had too many cherries, or was it that Hill was like, you know, my prostate is killing me? Mm-hmm. And I just want to go to bed. (laughs) Well, I think he's a human being. Hill's conflicted. He's just gotten this information from headquarters. Oh, that's the other option, yeah. You know, I mean, you would think Robert E. Lee maybe has better information than Johnston Pettigrew. Also, you don't serve Johnston Pettigrew. You serve Robert E. Lee. Right. Uh, So, And Pettigrew is new to the Army. Also, Henry Heath is new to the Army of Northern Virginia. He has a brief appearance at Chancellorsville. Right. That's it. The rest of the time, he's been out west. So, also, the third corps is a new corps. Yeah. So, what we've got is a relatively new brigade commander in Pettigrew, a new division commander in Henry Heath, and a new corps commander in A.P. Hill trying to analyze this intelligence. Yeah. And they kind of misread the situation. But I think what's very interesting, June 30th, Pettigrew is advancing with three regiments, as well as a battery of artillery, he will eventually grab some of John Brockenbrough's guys that are on um, picket duty, which I would have been pretty mad if I've been on picket duty all night, and now they tell me I have to march. <laughs> right. It's like, gee, thanks, guys. <laughs> so as they go through, they send the equivalent of a Confederate brigade supported by a battery of artillery on June 30th. What does Heath send the next day? The whole division. The whole division. <laughs> so what I think Heath is saying is I may not necessarily believe what Pettigrew is saying, But just in case. I'm going to be prepared. Right. We also see at this point, Hill will soon, by the morning of July 1st, also send a message to Richard Ewell saying that we have encountered enemy at Gettysburg. Right. So it's one of those trust but verify. And I think if you look at the way the morning of July 1st progresses, up to that point, Heath is thinking, hey, we called it right. 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 And then the first corps shows up on the battlefield and everything (laughs) goes to hell. Yeah. So I think it's not... I think it's easy to kind of criticize them after the fact. Sure. I think in the moment, and what I try to do when I interpret this battle is try to put myself in their shoes. Mm-hmm. What did they know? When did they know it? Anything they did not know does not matter to it me It does right not now. matter, no. And I think too often students of the battle get really, I don't want to say misled, but knowledge is a dangerous thing. Mm-hmm. When you know what happens, it impacts how you judge decisions. Yeah. And even when you read their reports. This is Henry Heath writing his report in September of 1863. This is months after this event. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have to really analyze it. I think you have to get out on the ground with the accounts, try to see what they see, and also take into account what, what is impacting me from knowing what they know. Maybe it's that big subdivision that wasn't here in 1863, <laughs> or you know any number of things. Yes. And, and so that's really how you break down Wood these lots. accounts. Woodlots are a big... Uh... Absolutely. And, and it's amazing how many times I have to explain what a woodlot is on a tour. <laughs> really? Yes. People are blown away. They're like, well, how do they move through these trees? Well, there was not as much undergrowth. Right. And I always make the example, you'd be amazed what a herd of goats would do. Yeah. They'd clear that out 
in a week. Yeah. But most people don't live near farms no. or agricultural areas. And also, they don't live near farms that are farming the way they did in the 1860s, mm-hmm. which is a vast difference in the way we farm today. Right. right. So all these things kind of play a role. And so this is really a long diatribe to explain that history is incredibly complex. Yeah. So if you're looking for simple answers, they're just not there, unfortunately. Well, that's what I always say to people is like, well, think of your own life and mm-hmm. everything that's going on today in the world or the country or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever. Is it easy to explain? Is it easy to understand? And no, the answer is no. It's complex. There's no, nothing's black and white and there's no two sides. There's like a million sides to every issue. Right. And uh, uh, the only thing that makes us think that everything before us was cut and dry is because textbooks made it seem that way. And we do have to do that in interpretation. Yeah. You do have to kind of consolidate events. You kind of have to maybe brush over some events to keep the narrative moving. Sure. I mean, when you got a three-day battle and you've got two hours to explain it, you're going to have to leave some stuff out. Sure. Yeah. And and so there is that. Even if you're writing it, I mean, we joked, my 27-volume history of 26 North Carolina, it's only going to be about 500 pages. Yeah, well, that's a pretty decent... But that's, you know, but that's... I'm leaving stuff out. I have to make that editorial decision on my own. Right. And so I think that's why... I've often been asked, you know, why are you writing a book on the 26? Isn't there already a book on the 26 out? Yes. But there's multiple books about the Battle of Gettysburg. There's multiple books there's about multiple just about everything. biographies of Robert E. Lee. Yeah. Uh, so talking about? every historian brings their own experience, their own kind of perspective to what they're working on. Right. Um, and I try not to demean anybody's work because, folks, writing a book is hard. Uh, I don't care who it is. So I always have a little bit of respect for that you know it's still an effort and but i think i also look at the accounts they use uh, the amount of time they spend on the ground i've spent thousands of hours on the battlefield where the 26 north carolina fought yeah i probably know the ground better than the 26 north carolina does <laughs> right, when right, they were here right uh, i also have access to more accounts than anybody has ever had the reason it's taken me almost 10 years is because I am, I do not, I know in my mind I cannot get every account. No. But it's not going to stop me from trying. But you're going to try and you got to, you got to look at them all to see yep. which is worth putting in and which is worth leaving out. Plus, I don't know if you're like me at all when it comes to this type of stuff, but um, you go through spurts of uh, either inspiration or motivation mm-hmm. to actually do the writing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's mentally exhausting stuff. Writing's my least favorite part. Uh, I'll I'll be honest. My, if I, it's if my I favorite po- part. It's I, I don't like the researching. I love the research. <laughs> I, I love the finding the information. Yeah. Uh, the impatient. problem is there's way too many historians and guides here in town that just compile, 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 and they never do anything with it. Mm. So eventually, you have to stop kind of being a history hoarder and. Clean out your garage. All right. So when yeah. are you cleaning out your garage and getting this damn book out? Well, you know, there's a little podcast I've got. There's work. There's other things. Um, I, in all seriousness, if, if I could podcast the book. Yeah. I well, would, you might want to do that. I, I honestly am still waiting to see if it's possible to take what would be a work of history and do it as a podcast. Why not? Uh, so it's a thought I've had uh, because I enjoy talking more than I do actually writing. And yeah, also, me too. There's things when you write, they don't get your inflection yes, always. Yes, yes, So at least when you hear the voice, okay, I get what they're saying. Now. Many, many uh, breakups I've had because they didn't understand inflection in a text message. Um, so it's good that you're blaming it all on them. Oh, it's I, always I appreciate them. that. Yeah. Always them. So you're writing a report after the Battle of Gettysburg. <laughs> it's always somebody else's fault, right? <laughs> yes. So yes. which one of your girlfriends didn't support your left flank? <laughs> So <laughs> they all didn't support my left one. Take him from the rear. Anyway, Whoa. so um, uh, now sh- I lost my train of thought. What were we? T- what were we saying? Serious history. Stuff. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah. very serious history stuff. So right, the writing and everything. Okay, so but you're you're gonna get it done. Yeah, and, and I think you should do it as a podcast because uh, here's why: uh, as much as people do like to still read, mm-hmm. most people are lazy. You'll you'll get more people with the podcast. I'll give you. I'll give you an example. And charge for it. I mean, the more I think about the reach our podcast has Mm -hmm. is further than any article I've ever written. Mm -hmm. It's further than any book I've ever written. Right. Um, My book is not in 92 foreign countries. No. My voice is, though. Right. So there's something to be said for that. And I think it is possibly the new way of doing history. I think there can be a hybrid 
for that. I am absolutely 100% sure it's the new way of doing anything mm-hmm. because that's where everything is heading. People, it's a passive thing. You can listen to it while you drive. You can listen yes. to it while you sit on the beach. You can listen to it while you're doing laundry. Like, mm-hmm. you know, you don't need a book. I have to stop. I have mm-hmm. to open the book. I have to sit with it and I have to read. I don't have that time. And I will publish something on the 26. I can't leave... I can't leave it to others. Well, you got to publish and, some kind of an article that points to your podcast. But I think, you know, I can't use every letter. I can on a podcast. Yes, you can. You know, and I think there's something to be said for reading entire letters rather than just take the bits you like. Because right. context is key. Absolutely. And so it's a thought I've had. There's other projects I've had that, you know, in years past, the idea has always been write a book. Yeah. I don't know if that's necessary right now. I mean, I, I don't need it for tenure. No. I don't need it yeah. for my job. Right, right. Um, and really, it's just a burden. Yeah. And I mean, to me, I want it to be as fun as possible. And I prefer talking to writing. So, Well, uh, I think you should do it. All right. So now, let's get to July 1st. Mm-hmm. July 1st, uh, Heath's division is moving in. But Pettigrew's brigade, though they've been to Gettysburg the mm-hmm. day before, is not in the lead. Right. Why? Eric Lindblade, why? It's administrative work in the Army. Mm-hmm. The regiment that led the advance the day the day before goes to the rear. The next unit goes to the front. And so what's the purpose of that? It's to rest you. It's also, um, people keep in mind, after June 30th, the 26th North Carolina goes on to picket duty all night. Mm-hmm. So they're staying up all night along Rock, on Marsh Creek. So it allows those guys to sleep in a little longer. Give them a little rest. Also, it's great to walk in the front of a column. Because you're not choking on you're dust. You're not choking on dust. It's a lot worse when you're in the back. Mm-hmm. So you take those guys that are in the back. They now get the front. You're, you're sort of... The guy in the front gets the better campsite. Yeah. You're, you're, what you're doing is you're spreading around the suck, essentially. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. And so that's what you're kind of looking to do. And that's, what, that's all it is. Um, I've often wondered. I mean... It's always dangerous when you do what-if history. Yeah. But let's just reverse it and say that Heath, on July on June 30th, uses his most experienced brigade to move towards Gettysburg. That would have been Archer's brigade. Mm. Imagine if it's, the, if it's Pettigrew's brigade moving down the road on July 1st at the Iron Brigade encounters. Mm. They're not outflanking Pettigrew. Mm. So little things like that. Sometimes a battle's determined on who is in the lead of the march the day before. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's where, when you try to look at this, there's things that kind of look like they're preordained. There's other things that just kind of happen. Sure. And that's the case. So the 26th North Carolina will be at the end of the division. On July 1st, they're advancing. They will hear the fighting in front of them. They'll see wounded coming back. There's an interesting account they are actually shot at while on the Chambersburg Pike. Probably one of the vedettes of Buford, most likely. Where, where this is while they're still when when is it somewhere this? between Marsh Creek and Hare's Ridge on the thirtieth on the first on the first so they said they received fire and they temporarily deployed because of that and then they get back and it's just one of those little things mentioned in passing but it was always very interesting the moment you read it, you go whoa 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 who shot at them you guys got shot at who was it right for John Jones just yeah another day at the office right. got shot at. Yeah. And so little things like that. And then initially they were deployed on the north side of the Chambersburg Pike. But then they get sent back to the south side. They're behind the batteries on Hare's Ridge when they're brought forward to what I've kind of named Pettigrew's Woods. Mm -hmm. So if you ever go down Country Club Road here, Country Club Lane, I I just call it Country Club. Right. So that's actually, if you're driving down, you'll see woods to your right. Mm -hmm. That's actually National Park property. Okay. Which is probably the least visited part of the park ever. You never see people in the woods. No. You know, and so I've dubbed them Pettigrew's Woods. Okay. They are, it's really between Willoughby's Run and Hare's Ridge is where it is. And that's where they're waiting. Now, for the 26th, they deploy skirmishers. You'll have parts of the 47th North Carolina and the 52nd North Carolina skirmishing with elements of Union First Corps units. In fact, it'll be the 52nd North Carolina that burns the Harmon Farm. Hmm. Uh, which will delay them in their attack on July 1st. So for most of it, they're just kind of waiting. And then about 2.30, they get orders they're going in. Now they know that there is an enemy force in front of them. They might know it's the Iron Brigade. Um, you know, you sometimes see the 26 accounts saying, taint no militia, that's the black hats. <laughs> no, they probably know who's in front of them. You know, um, yeah, because so, so, so we, we, we skipped the, the whole morning here because mm-hmm. they weren't, 
they fighting really during anything. the morning. Yeah. So just so anybody in case you're wondering what what just happened there we skipped over that so they're not fighting in the morning right uh in the afternoon they go in though um and uh okay so i just wanted to clarify that for everybody so So when they go in we're looking at i say approximately 900 men um i've studied this regiment for years i cannot tell you every single guy who was on detail on july 1st Mm -hmm. i just can't uh but you do know there's a certain number of them and so when they enter, they begin to move forward. So if you picture this advance, it's the 26th North Carolina that leads the advance. Next in line is the 11th North Carolina, followed by the 47th North Carolina, and finally the 52nd North Carolina. So the 26th will actually mm-hmm. be the first to engage the Iron Brigade. And to give you a sense of their frontage, we often talk about the 26th against the 24th. Hmm. The left flank, the 26th North Carolina, is probably fighting at least some elements of the 2nd Wisconsin. Right. The right flank is also dealing with some of the 19th Indiana. It has to be. So it's a massive unit. So when we just say one regiment, yeah, most of the fighting is between the 24th and 26th. But they're also having some fire from others as well. But put it in perspective, Archer's Brigade, for example, is how many people? 1,200? 1,100? Somewhere in that ballpark. Just over 1,000. 26 North Carolina, a regiment is just below a thousand. Well, the 26 North Carolina is bigger than Lang's Brigade here in Gettysburg. Go. There you go. They're bigger than the Irish Brigade. Yeah. Well, every, everything. Well, like everybody's like. I'm bigger than the Irish Brigade. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, by Gettysburg. At least. Yeah. So, but but I mean that kind of puts it in perspective. This is not your typical regiment here. I mean, your usual regiment here is 300, 350 guys on average. Yeah. This is the equivalent of almost three of those. This is like so, beginning of the war size almost. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And not only that, it's beginning of the war size, but it's also veteran troops and veteran officers. Right. Which makes it a pretty dangerous foe to be fighting on the first day. I can't imagine that. I mean, honestly, like, yeah, especially when you're when you're in a, in the woods, let's say, and there's all these other regiments that are between, you know, three hundred mm-hmm. and four hundred men or whatever, some lower or higher, whatever. And there's just one. Yeah, <laughs> that's the size of a brigade, basically. Mm-hmm. It's just hard to imagine, and they're against the m- mostly against the twenty fourth Michigan. Mostly. And um, now, how many men did the twenty fourth Michigan have? Twenty fourth Michigan's numbering close to five hundred. I mean, so, it's, I think it's like four eighty something at yeah. that point. But we'll just for ease of use, just say five hundred. Right. Okay. So, so about five hundred, and then so the whole Iron Brigade is what eighteen hundred, I think. And the bulk. I mean, the biggest regiment in that is. 24th Michigan. Yeah. Because they're the new guys. Right. You know, they have not had the quintessential Iron Brigade experience. Right. They're they're <laughs> still kind of proving themselves. They are. Yeah. And and if you also, I think it's very interesting, if you look at the the order the Iron, that the Iron Brigade goes in in the morning, they lead the 2nd Wisconsin, you've got the 7th Wisconsin, you've got the 19th Indiana in line, you've got the 24th Michigan, and then you've got the 6th Sixth Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Well, the 6th Wisconsin gets held back. So as they enter into that initial fight against Archer, it's the 2nd Wisconsin that kind of leads the fight. Right. Well, then it's the 24th Michigan that actually outflanks Archer and really is what does Archer in. Uh-huh. But when they get into the woods and they kind of redeploy themselves, they switch their alignment. So now what we see is we're looking from the right of the Iron Brigade. So the mm-hmm. side closest to the Chambersburg Pike. Right. You now have the 7th Wisconsin, the 2nd Wisconsin, the 24th Michigan, and then the 19th Indiana. You're putting veteran troops on their flank. You don't want the 24th Michigan to be your flank regiment. Right. You want your veteran troops. And also, it's not a coincidence that they put the 2nd Wisconsin beside them. The 2nd Wisconsin is heavily battered on the first day. And... They're the most veteran unit in the Iron Brigade. Mm. They put the new guys next to them. Right. These are things that don't get written in reports, yeah. but they happen. It's and very there's, I think, a reason why for that. So, so that's interesting, because I, I knew that they switched the alignment. I didn't know why, and I was going to ask you that after you said it, but you just answered the questions. So that was perfect. See, it's, it, I also uh, I have ESPN. I can read other people's <laughs> minds. <laughs> also, have ESPN 8, the Ocho. So... <laughs> <laughs> the Ocho. Yeah. The Ocho. Yeah, it's really great. Um, I mean, competitive shuffleboarding at 3 a.m. is, you got to watch it, folks. You're missing the boat. <laughs> so, who, okay. Uh, tell us about the fight in McPherson's Woods. How does it go? Is it just straight in and push the Iron Brigade back and everybody's happy? Or Well, what we have is, it- is the 26 deploys skirmishers. That skirmish line will push back the skirmish line of the Iron Brigade, Mm -hmm. which I tend to place on the east side of Willoughby's Run. 
the, that just seems, the Iron Brigade the Iron Brigade. That seems to make more sense to me. Yeah, why would you make um, them? Yeah. And yeah. so they're going to be falling back to the main line. So the 26th we'll talk about as they're advancing down. They're kind of a, going downhill because they're yeah. going down Hare's Ridge. Right. And they'll say that a lot of the Union shots were initially high. Um, one soldier says as they're advancing through the field, he said it was the balls were kind of skipping around. He said it was like grasshoppers in the fall. Hmm. I think it's kind of a really cool Yeah, that's a cool uh, image. And when they reach Willoughby's Run is really when all hell breaks loose for them. Uh, they're having to cross under fire. If you've ever walked down to that today, try crossing it. The briars, the undergrowth. Yeah. People are like, oh, that wasn't like that in 1863. It was just like that in 1863. And so they have to get through that. And as they get across Willoughby's Run, there's a little rivulet just maybe 10 yards from it. The accounts suggest that is where they reform the regiment. Uh-huh. Then they begin to make that push up towards today what is really Meredith Avenue. Right. So keep in mind the 24th Michigan is where Meredith Avenue is today. They're not where their monument is. And I'm glad you brought that up because I was talking about this some of the other day. Um, yeah, the monuments in general uh, mm-hmm. here at Gettysburg are roughly the area mm-hmm. that the regiment was in. Right. Not specifically for the most part, correct? Right. And and a lot of it is any number of things they put in modern day Meredith Avenue there, which basically cut a big slice yeah. of the ridge out. And so if you look at where they were, they were just basically along where the avenue is today. Right. You could even argue where the 26th North Carolina's monument is. It's yeah. probably where the 24th Michigan was, ironically enough. That makes sense. But, I mean, w- it, but it makes sense, though, because if you're going to try to hold a hill, which is what that is, right. it's a ridge, right? Uh, you don't do it from the tippy top. Mm-hmm. You do it from the military slope. It's the military crest, yeah, the military crest, slope. Thank you. Either yes. way. No, no, no. And, crest and, is what I was looking and, for. And what you look at is, because if you're falling back, you want to fall back to the top of the hill. Right. It also obscures you as a target. Yeah. Imagine, well, you won't be able to do it for very long. You can't do it right now. But assuming you're standing on a little round top, (laughs) use your imagination, folks. (laughs) Look towards Devil's Den. When you see people standing on top of the ridge, they are perfectly silhouetted. Yeah. They are wonderful targets. Perfect targets. But look at the people down the parking lot. Yeah. It's night and day. Right. So the 26th will advance up now towards the 24th Michigan. They eventually reach anywhere between 20 to 40 paces apart from each other. This is where the Jeez. advance of the 26th North Carolina stops. This is where that slug fest begins. And people always say, well, why didn't they just fall back? They had nowhere to go. Right. They're, they're boxed in. They've got Brock and Bra's. Well, I'm not going to give Brock and Bra's brigade to say they were that far up yet. Um, they, they took their sweet time, uh, a leisurely <laughs> stroll towards oh, McPherson's Ridge. They're Virginia gentlemen. Well, <laughs> I have another term, but this is a family show. Um, no, but, it's not. No, well, it's you can of listen to no, it we, we, we have kids. We yeah, have kids you don't like your kids. I don't know. We do have kids. <laughs> so, <in this. laughs> so as they advance, they've also got the 11th North Carolina on their right. So how do you, you can't advance there. And the 11th is in an absolutely death struggle mm. with the 19th Indiana. Mm. If it wasn't for the 24th Michigan and the 26th North Carolina, we'd all be talking about the 11th North Carolina and the 19th Indiana. Mm. Hmm. That is the second bloodiest regimental level combat of the Battle of Gettysburg. Really? I've they, never heard that before. They are, well, unfortunately, they get overlooked by the bloodiest regimental level, which is the 26th North Carolina and 25th Michigan. Uh, <laughs> they're next so, door neighbors. Yeah, they're next door neighbors. Yeah. They can't go anywhere. Yeah. And, and people have often said, you know, was it because they were new, they didn't know any better? They didn't have anywhere to go. And if you look at areas of the battlefield where casualties really begin to pile up, right. it's because these units don't have the ability to maneuver. If you can maneuver, you can escape a lot of that fire. If you can't maneuver, you got to take it head on. Mm-hmm. And what we begin to see is this very brutal, bloody fight that initially lasts maybe 15, 20 minutes. Hmm. Most of the casualties of the 26th North Carolina are inflicted between Willoughby's Run and modern-day Meredith Avenue. On July 1st, I placed their loss at about 650. So the majority of their losses were on July 1st? Yes, by far. Yeah. Uh, um, Okay, so... What did you say, 20 minutes? 15, about, 20 about minutes? 15, 20 minutes initially. And then what we have is, by this point, Chapman Biddle's entire brigade is being outflanked. Okay. So as they're beginning to fall back. And who's doing that? Lane? This is going to, well, not Lane yet. Oh. It's 52nd North Carolina doing this. Oh, okay. So L- Lane's still behind. Okay. Now, what's very interesting at that moment is 52nd is advancing. If you picture that part of Confederate Avenue, if you go right across the Fairfield Road, Middle Street. Right. 
that is where William Gamble's troopers are. Yes. At one point, Gamble actually orders his men to mount. The colonel of the 52nd North Carolina, James Marshall, grandson of Chief Justice John Marshall. Interesting. Sees this and orders his men to form an infantry square. Now, so this is true. This is true. Okay. Now, uh, it's 52nd North Carolina that forms the infantry square. Uh-huh. It's not Lane's brigade. Brigade. They get okay. confused. So that kind of, well, you know, they had to burn a farm. They had to form an infantry square. You know, typical issues you have on a Wednesday at work. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how many times on my way to work I've got to form an infantry square with my tour, and then you know I got to burn a barn down. Right. It, Sorry, makes, guys. Yeah, it makes a great bus tour. Uh, <laughs> fifth graders love it. Uh, they love setting barns on fire, man. Yeah. Those fifth graders now are little pyros. Oh right? yeah, but, little uh, barn burners. They are. You know, and it was a barn burner of a tour, literally. <laughs> uh, so so now as we have this, they eventually outflank Biddle's men, and Biddle is in an untenable position. I, I would argue anybody just stand where the hundred twenty first. Pennsylvania's monument is, and consider what they are facing, mm. you're getting out of there quick. Yeah. So already one end of that line is already wavering. If we go back towards the Chambersburg Pike, Roy Stone's brigade is being heavily pressured by Junius Daniels' brigade of Rhodes' division. Right. And then you still have Brockenbrough's men advancing. So what we have now is gaps are beginning to open up in the line. As Biddle's line is being outflanked, a gap is going to open between Biddle and the 19th Indiana. Mm-hmm. The 19th Indiana has to fall back to try to keep some relative contact with Biddle's men. Mm-hmm. This opens up a gap. Mm. Men of the 11th North Carolina push right through it. Now the 19th Indiana is being pushed out. This causes the 24th Michigan to have to refuse their line. Right. Which people forget when you refuse your line, you lose firepower to one part of your line. Sure. So it's at this point, as this is going on, they're already being outflanked. This is when Henry Bergwin is most likely mortally wounded in this part of the fight. The 26 essentially stops at this point. If there's a moment where they're going to break, it's right now. But they don't break. They're getting a little bit of a reprieve. The firepower from the 24th Michigan has been thinned greatly, not only from casualties, but also having to refuse their line. Mm. And at this point, John Lane, the lieutenant colonel, gets the 26 moving. They begin to then push forward. So it's a combination of just this mass of the 26th North Carolina, but also the movements to their left and right that ultimately compel the 24th Michigan to have to fall back. Eventually, you're going to have them moving through the woods. And depending on whose account you read, supposedly the 24th Michigan makes eight separate stands in the woods. The problem is we know when they engage the 26th North Carolina approximately. Mm -hmm. We know when they're back on Seminary Ridge. Mm -hmm. There is no way they made eight separate stands. <laughs> okay. Math can't do that. Okay. The math has to match. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's you know if the glove doesn't fit, you must yeah, quit. That's true. You know, that um, is so true. So, but that glove did fit. Well. <laughs> Actually, I'd like part of the money today to go to OJ's quest to find the real killer. <laughs> you know when he did that? So, I think he's still on the hunt. Well, he'll find him. Yeah. I, I oh, believe in him. Listen. I have faith in the juice. All in due time. I have faith in the juice. I do, too. So now, as the 26th... See, nobody ever thought we'd have an OJ Simpson record no. in the 26th of North Carolina. <laughs> uh, so now, as this is happening, the 26th is kind of pushing them through. Well, the Iron Brigade's getting out of there as quick as they can. In fact, the last Union Brigade to leave McPherson's Ridge is actually Roy Stone's Bucktails. Hmm. That often gets forgotten. Um, so, Doesn't because there job. is there is this misnomer that it's only the Iron Brigade that fought the Confederates on July first. That's no. it. It was the Iron Brigade yeah. against all of Heath's division. Oh no, there was a uh, whole bunch. So, more. what we see is now these units are falling back. Now, if you're having them falling back, somebody's got to do a rear guard action. Mm-hmm. That's the 151st Pennsylvania. Right. So, they are really the forgotten regiment of McPherson's Ridge. They are. And, and we talk about, you know, you think about the Battle of Gettysburg, the heroic charge, the, the stoic defense. Nobody ever talks about the rear guard actions these guys have to do. Yeah. Guys like the 151st Pennsylvania, 16th Heckman's Maine. Battery, the 16th Maine, the 45th New York. Yeah, Heckman's yeah. Battery. I mean, that that's some story, too, with yeah. them. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's right. collectively, these units will buy you five to ten minutes here or there that allows the Army of the Potomac to live to fight another day. Uh-huh. And so we now have the 26th North Carolina advancing. Yes, they've lost 650 guys possibly at this point. They've still got roughly 
250 still in the ranks. Yeah. So they're now to an average size. Right, right. right. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> and then at this point, like everybody you know, else. the 151st Pennsylvania looks at the situation. I mean, imagine standing where they are. You've got the rest of Pettigrew's brigade coming at you on one side. You've got Junius Daniel coming at you on another. You've got Brock and Brian. You've got the 26th and 11th advancing towards you. Yeah. They get out of Dodge pretty quick. Yeah. But they do their job. By this point, the 26th North Carolina is out of ammunition. We know this because we have a letter that discusses how they had to go back through the woods to gather ammunition from wounded soldiers on both sides. So your average soldier carries 40 to 60 rounds of ammunition. A good soldier can fire two to three shots a minute. Well, we're looking at 20, 30 minutes. If you really look at the time for most fights at the Battle of Gettysburg, it's 20 to 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of gives us some semblance of timing. Now, by this point, the 26th North Carolina and the 11th North Carolina, they're absolutely wrecked. They will stay at the edge of the woods. In fact, they probably go to the reverse slope of those woods. If you ever walk the little path behind the Reynolds mm-hmm, marker mm-hmm. there, you'll notice the ground drops down. Yeah. I'm, well, right now, if you're Major John Jones, who's in command of the 26th North Carolina, you're going to put those guys just behind there to give them a little bit of protection. They will be in support as William Dorsey Pender's division is now sweeping across to ultimately drive Union troops off of Seminary Ridge. So... Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, you mentioned Bergwin. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us about him. He is a very unique officer here. He is 21 years old. Mm-hmm. He is affectionately nicknamed the Boy Colonel of the Confederacy today. That was not necessarily a positive mm-hmm. when he got that nickname. Uh, is that like flavor of the month? Well, what happens is, as I mentioned before, Zeb Vance was the first colonel of the 26th North Carolina. Yeah. Zeb Vance was a former congressman from Western North Carolina. He refuses throughout 1861 to serve in the Confederate Congress. Hmm. People go, well, my gosh, why don't you serve? Well, he says, well, I'm out fighting. I don't have po- I don't, I don't have for politics. I'm fighting. Well, he's also waiting for the governorship to open up. <laughs> So he's looking for a bigger prize. Right. Um, And North Carolina will see the initial governor, John Ellis, die in early 1861. So at this point in 1862, it's Henry Clark, who is kind of the fill-in. And then you get in 1862, the election. Vance will run for governor. He is elected. He leaves the regiment in August of 1862. Now, protocol would suggest that if your colonel leaves, who takes over? It's lieutenant Lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel, yeah. Well, the problem is, this time, the lieutenant colonel is 20 years old. Okay. This is Henry Bergwin. At this point, they're under the brigade of Robert Ransom. Ah, yes. Nobody knows who he is here because Ransom's brigade wasn't here. So, they're one of those units. They they get, you know, um, they're your Jenkins brigade. You know, some of these Micah brigades, Jenkins. Micah Jenkins yeah. that, don't, that aren't here, but right. they're, they're still technically on the rolls. And so, what we now have is, Ransom says, I don't want any boy colonels. <laughs> in my brigade. Well, the men of the 26th said, hey, we want Bergwin as our colonel. So he was a respected... By that point, yes. Okay. Initially, he was not. Um, uh-huh. I have a great letter from a soldier from Company C from Wilkes County that talks about really how, for lack of a better term, how much of a hard ass Bergwin was. Because here you have Vance was the politician. Mm. He gives you the rah-rah speeches. Everybody loves him. He's like the popular principal. Right. Bergwin is the assistant principal that nobody likes because he's the one that does all the discipline. Right. He's the one that keeps really the organization running. Mm-hmm. These guys didn't like him on the drill field. But after the Battle of Newburn, when Bergwin almost single-handedly saves the 26, they go, this guy might be a hard ass. He might be a pain to work with. But he's a guy that's going to keep us alive on a battlefield. Mm. I kind of like that guy. So he had earned their respect. Well, fortunately, Bergwin's father was kind of a roving troubleshooter for the Confederacy. He had the ear of Jefferson Davis. So he says, you know, Mr. President, we've got this situation. My boy has a boss that he doesn't like and doesn't like him. Can we do something about it? (laughs) Well, they do a trade. Johnston Pettigrew has just been given a brand new brigade. Well, they need a veteran regiment there. Hmm. Just so happens a veteran regiment is now in the market. Hmm. So they now shift them to what becomes Pettigrew's Brigade. Ransom's men will have a very brutal time at Antietam. Yeah. So the 26 kind of misses out on that, going back to what I said earlier about they miss out on some of these battles. Okay. But this is what now brings them to the Pettigrew, Kirkland, McCray Brigade that they will be part of through the rest of the war. Um, so he, uh, young man... Now he's respected by Gettysburg. He's respected. And you're thinking in that first 
push, so he's taken down. If or, you walk behind the 26 North Carolina's monument today on Meredith Avenue, it will flatten out. Yeah. And interestingly enough, if you pace it off from the road to where it flattens out, it's 20 paces. Mm-hmm. Huh. They mentioned that in a letter. Mm. Funny how that works out. <laughs> and But it's also a place where they would have to stop because it's where you get that really steep incline, right. which is where the 24th Michigan would have put their guys. Right. So that's really where that slugfest takes place. And I'm not one to be able to tell you when every flag bearer of the 26th went down. That doesn't start until 1907. So, but that's now you bring up the second thing I wanted to get to. Tell us about, was it 13? Supposedly. 13, 14, we don't really know. Needless to say, that flag went down a lot. Yeah. And at one point, the flag goes down, Bergwin picks it up. Now, most of the accounts I have, which is challenging because I have four separate accounts on how he got mortally wounded. They're all different. <sighs> now, how, did they differ how? Typically, what position he's in. Some okay. have him kind of holding his sword out with the flag beside him. Another one has him handing the, the flag off to someone else, which to me tends to make sense because his wound is in the side. Mm. The ball goes through both of his lungs. Mm. Uh, he's, he's drowning to death. God. Um, so when he goes down, it's at some point in that moment, which I kind of call the that first phase between the skirmish line's been driven back and now we get this period of the 24th and the 26th slugging it out. He's wounded, mortally, as we will see. And then, of course, Lane comes over and, and gets assumes command and then gets them moving again. But we do have accounts where supposedly Bergen was talking, which I have. A, I mean, I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV. But if you, if it's through if your lungs, shot through both lungs, yeah. I don't see you talking. Maybe very quietly. Or, oh, yeah. And so, I mean, there's one that supposedly he says, you know, have the boys done their duty today. Of course, anybody in the 19th century that dies gets to say something profound. Of course, they die. yeah. Not a, you never hear, oh, crap, my ribs hurt. <laughs> you know, like, you don't get that. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, the really guy's well. screaming bloody murder because he's just been shot through his side. Sure. We don't get that. We always want to be, you know, tough and say something profound. And I noticed after the Civil War, or maybe after the 19th century, mm-hmm. um, people had horrible last words. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people didn't have last words. Yeah. You know? So I wonder, uh, th- that generation was just remarkable. So he is do you, but back. Do, wait, do you, I'm sorry. Do you oh. really think that those were his last words, or do you think that's what someone said for propaganda purposes? We have a letter written by J.J. Young, another Young, uh, who was the was essentially the quartermaster of the 26th North Carolina, but a very good friend with Bergwin. And he writes a letter to Bergwin's father saying, this is where we buried him. This is how you can find the body. He gives him a very detailed description of where it is. Uh, that house is still standing today, by the way, where he was buried. Which, which house is it? It is the one that's across in the same property as Grafcom. That's where oh. Bergwin is initially buried okay. in that area. The family will retrieve the body in 1867, which is really interesting because that's three years. Yeah before really the bulk of Confederate bodies are being moved. But that's where he will initially be buried from 18, from July 1st, 1863 until 1867 when the family brings his body back. I mean, you got, uh, what, two of those years, the war still going on. Right. Um, and then you got two more years. I, I'm Maybe they're thinking... Let's just make sure he's nothing but bone because I don't want to be, you know, rooting through soup. And one of the, it's a blessing and a curse. The Bergwin family has a wonderful collection of papers at the University of North Carolina as well as the State Archives in Raleigh. And they have detailed business accounts for everything. The year they don't have detailed business accounts is 1867. So we don't know who they paid here. We don't know who they used. We know that somehow the body comes from Gettysburg back to Raleigh, North Carolina. So we have to kind of speculate a little bit, but uh, the family was well-to-do. Also, Bergwin's mother was from Boston. Oh, they have Northern Connections. Oh, yeah, That helps blood. as well. So, yeah, you get the irony. Bergwin is actually born in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts. Really? So we have a Massachusetts-born Confederate colonel squaring off against a North Carolina-born Union Brigade commander in Solomon Meredith. Interesting. So... As I say with history, it doesn't have to be possible, it just has to be true. And it's not black and white and cut and dry. No. It's very dirty. And so, you know, the body's brought back, uh, and he becomes kind of this great martyr for the 26. Um, he's a big loss. He's also a big loss for a historian because 
almost any day he could, he kept a diary entry. And he also wrote letters to his parents. Oh. So we have this wealth of information that, and this is what kind of frustrates me as a historian. It's not just the human tragedy. It's the historical loss. We have a guy that was writing a lot. Right. I really need him in 1864. <laughs> He's not there. So, uh, but what is, what is uh, uh, does he? What's the last uh, journal entry or uh, letter that you, we have of him? June thirtieth. So the day before. The day before. And yep. what does he write? He just talks about the the men have advanced towards Gettysburg. That's about it. Yeah. You know, nothing major. And a lot of these diary entries, some of them are really good. Other, it, it rained today. Mm-hmm. And that's your diary entry. Yeah. Uh, so, and also keep in mind, as an officer, as a colonel, he has got a lot of paperwork coming across his desk. We forget that officers had paperwork. Right. And so, he, he, you will see at times the writing changes because he might have better light writing, say, at 10 in the morning, mm-hmm. as opposed to now it's 9 at night and he's got to finish this letter. So you'll see him kind of picking it up in different, you can see different writing styles I gotcha. and things like yeah, that. Yeah. But um, he's, you know, a a major figure in the 26th North Carolina. He is the reason the regiment becomes the regiment it is. It's yeah. his training. It's his example. that He really forms the 26th into the unit that will it be. And I will argue... <laughs> The best days are still to come for the 26th North Carolina. Their most effective years are actually 1864. Hmm. Um, so I think it's a, there is a very much, with the history of the 26th, there's the history up to Gettysburg, and there's history after Gettysburg. Yeah, yeah. And in many ways, it's two different regiments. So if you think that um, they took about 600 and change casualties mm-hmm. in McPherson's Woods, I, I you know, it, after you said that, I just imagined what the slopes of that hill must have looked like coming up from Willoughby's Run. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's a it's a decent distance down to the run, but it's not that much no. space. So, I mean, it just had to be littered with dead and writhing in pain men. And that's just the 26th. Yeah, exactly. Not the 24th Michigan either. No. Um, we have one letter from John McGilvery, a officer in Company H, that will write to his father. He's at a hospital in Winchester just a week after the battle. He says the ground was literally blue. Yeah, and and I don't think that's an exaggeration in some cases, like in this case particularly. No. Like, and we have another letter from William Edwards, a private in Company E, <clears throat> that he says when he gets wounded in the hip, he begins to walk back, mm. and that's when it hits him. He talks about just how helpless he felt. Guys are yelling, water, help mm. me. There's nothing he can do. Mm. And in just the sense of just helplessness. Yeah. Um, I should note also that William Edwards will walk back to Winchester, Virginia, after the battle. Wow. So get a 58 caliber musket ball to your hip and go walking. <laughs> um, Dude, if so. I bang my hip on a door jam, I'm done for a week. Yeah. That's amazing. So, um, so it's you, you get these letters. And I think this is why it's so important to really go through the written accounts of not only the officers, but try to get as many accounts from the enlisted men yeah. as you can. Do you find that those are more candid? Yes, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Um, I have one letter from an officer, Samuel Wagg, that gets killed on July 3rd, very close to the wall. And he writes to his brother, a Presbyterian minister, before the Battle of Gettysburg, and he tells them about this strange occurrence that is happening, this rumor that's floating through the camp after the Battle of Chancellorsville. And he writes to his brother that General Lee's wife is suing for divorce. Now, when I read this, I went, holy crap, I've just made a million dollars. I'm going to (laughs) be publishing this, and this is going to be great, until I realized it was a horrible joke. Ah. He said, after that, you know, Robert E. Lee's wife is suing for divorce. And he says, do you want to know why? She caught him chasing a hooker. <laughs> so there you go. And I was like, there goes my million dollar moment. Thanks, Samuel Wagg. But no, uh, but that might shed some light, though, yeah. on the origin of the term hooker for a prostitute. Well, yes and no. That that term actually dates back to the days of Shakespeare. So th- that's what I've heard. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, it is older than the Civil War. Yeah, the idea of if you were a sailor at sea, yeah. you, know, you don't have any women aboard. Mm-hmm. So when you're now paid after you get back... You've been at sea for a couple months, sometimes a year. Mm-hmm. There's certain things you might want. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want it, there are women, as you're walking down these seaport towns, that Offering. would just grab you and they said would hook you oh. and bring you inside. So they were hookers. They were hookers. That so, makes more sense. Yeah. So it's one of those, yes, it's like, it's, like the, it's like the horse hooves here at Gettysburg. Yeah. Yeah. Every myth has a little kernel of truth. Right. 
it's not named after Joseph Hooker. No. But Hooker certainly popularizes the term. But he, but uh, was he not in charge of a district of brothels or, or something like that, uh, or a district that had brothels in it, and they called it Hooker's Division? Have you heard that story? Well, his headquarters was called a combination of a bar room and a brothel. So, <laughs> yeah. No, um, but this was in D.C. I'm early sure, in the war, I think. Well, I mean, if he's- you heard this, Mike? If he's in an administrative post, I mean, even if you're, say, in charge of D.C., you would that would come under your purview. I mean, yeah. it was the medical staff that regulated the brothels right. in D.C. Right. Um, so that. So you never was, heard it called never, Hooker's Division? I, no, I, not that I have. Not saying it's not, but right. I haven't heard it. I have. I think it was more because of his reputation. Yeah. That, okay. that row gets that nickname. Well, that makes okay. So, but there's the kernel of truth then to the people that think it comes from the Civil War. That they, they, that was just happenstance. It worked mm-hmm. out that a guy's name was Hooker, and there's a district of brothels mm-hmm. in his district that he's in charge of, and right. it's like, oh hey, Hooker's got the hookers, right? Yeah, and okay. also, I mean, he partaked in the merchandise. Of course, he did. So, uh, <laughs> you know, his good buddy Dan Sickles and Dan Butterfield. Yeah, oh yeah. As I say, people say, what? Where would you like to be in the Civil War? Man, put me at Hooker's headquarters. Yeah. That sounds would be like a great to time. watch. Like I would, I would just sit back and just watch because it had to be hilarious. Oh, it had to be something for sure. So, uh, all right. So, how do they? Oh, so okay. Now, so I think we left off. They're approaching Seminary Ridge. Mm-hmm. So what? Ha- or no, no. I'm sorry. Uh, a pen, they're they're in the woods. Mm-hmm. Pender's going to Seminary Pender's Ridge. Going in. Yeah. Now at this point, the 26 will eventually come back to the woods where they started from. Okay. Now, one of the things that you'll sometimes see with regiments when they go into battle, they will be ordered to take off as much extra equipment as they need. You, if you've got a knapsack, you've got a blanket roll, you ditch that, because mm-hmm. that can get in the way. A smart soldier realizes we may never go back to where we started from, right. so I'm going to wear that on. But there were folks left behind to guard packs and things like that. So you can imagine, as you're coming back, there's nobody claiming those knapsacks. Yeah. Really claiming those blanket rolls. And then the guys start to see as the regiment kind of comes back in, they've gone from 900 men to anywhere between two, maybe around 200 in that area. Because we know on July 3rd, we get their troop strength is anywhere between 210 to 275. That's amazing. So I often say approximately 250. I kind yeah, of that's a right good, in the middle that's there. A good, yeah. um, but I think that's when it really shocks them. It's not so much in the battle itself. It's when they finally get that chance to kind of decompress and look around. They realize now they're all gone. Yeah. We're the only ones that are left. Um, what a feeling that must be. Company F entered the battle with 97 men. Right. They lose 94 on July 1st. Yeah. So That's... imagine you're that guy. Um, now they lo- on July 1st, they lost them. On July 1st. Did, so, w- was there maybe I'm thinking of a different regiment? Was there no? I think I'm talking about the 11th Mississippi. Was there a regiment that lost all of Company F? Supposedly the University Grays of the 11th Mississippi That's did. It. Yeah. Um, but for a long time, Company F, the 26th North Carolina, has it was said they lost everybody in Company F in the battle between July 1st and July 3rd. Maybe, maybe not. Oh. And I would argue even the same thing with the 11th Mississippi, because it's very hard of Confederate records to fully say with absolute certainty that everybody was wounded. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, they didn't get 100% casualties, but 94 out of 97 is a horrific day. <laughs> so let's not, just because you're, you're at, if you're not at 100, it's still, it still doesn't count. Yeah, yeah. It still doesn't count. Right. Uh, no, it counts. But, so what we will begin to see is they will pull what they called extra duty men, guys that were cooks, teamsters, guarding wagons, anything else, to come up to the ranks. So on the morning of July 3rd, when the 26th North Carolina is on the rear slope of Seminary Ridge, Company F numbers a whopping eight soldiers. Mm. So they go into Pickett's charge of eight men. Jeez. It's like, why would you send... Wouldn't you say, okay, you guys can sit this one out? Because A, eight guys aren't going to make a difference. And B, it's like, what what are you trying to get us all killed? You know? Yeah. And and I think it's the situation that these July 1st units, and it's not just Pettigrew's guys. No. It's Scales. It's Junius Daniel. It's Alfred Iverson. It's um, Edward O'Neill. I mean, there's a lot. Even we look at more successful brigades on July 1st, like George Doles or John Gordon, they still lose 20, 25% of their Mm. command. Yeah. It's, it's unreal the loss the Confederates suffer on July 1st. Well, and then you think about, too, uh, how many Confederate brigades and 
divisions on July 3rd are being led by people who weren't leading them on July 1st. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, it, I mean, from the top down, it's just decimated. Well, decimated. I'll give you a word. great example. On the morning of July first, Major John Jones, the 26th North Carolina, is the third ranking officer in the 26th North Carolina. Yeah. By about 4:15, 4:30, when they're back on Seminary Ridge on July third, he's in command of the brigade. <laughs> There are no field officers left. That's crazy. Pettigrew is having to bounce back and forth between division commands. So you have a major commanding a brigade after Gettysburg. Amazing. A captain, Henry Albright, commands the 26th North Carolina. There are six of the 10 companies that do not have a single company level officer left. Wow. They're under the command of sergeants and corporals. I, it's it's so hard to imagine that. And being, being the survivors, you know, you want to talk about survivor's guilt. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's some surprise. And one of the things I've really delved into was that period from after Gettysburg to really the end of August, where you read some of the soldiers' letters, and some of them talk about I can't focus on reading. Every time I I sit around, all I do is start crying. Mm. All the guys that I went to war with are no longer here. Mm. I'm I am not a mental health professional, but I think we can all tell they're suffering some pretty severe mental distress. At least depression, because I can't focus on reading, and I have depression, yeah. and um, every time it's it's uh, acting up, mm-hmm. I, I can't focus on reading even more. And and I think it's, we also forget, you know, as strong as the bonds are in a military unit today, the Civil War's different. Mm-hmm. These are all men from the same communities. Right. So it's not, the loss isn't just your buddy you met you know, when you entered the unit, mm-hmm. that's your brother. Mm-hmm. That's your best friends from school, or that's your sister's husband. Right. That just adds an extra layer of heaviness to it. Because when it's you go home, really, yeah, like yeah. if you survive and you go home, you're going to have to see all their grieving faces. One of the things I've done is I pulled the 1860 census from every county uh-huh. that the 26 North Carolina is formed from, and I printed them out. So I actually have, if anybody's interested, I do have a copy of the Caldwell County Census from 1860. You know, I was wondering interested. where I could get a copy that's, of that. Uh, that's a hot seller, folks. <laughs> uh, so get it while you can. <laughs> you know, we made the Batchelder Papers possible. I might make the 1860 Caldwell County Census <laughs> popular. You so all the Gettysburg people buy that now. Yeah. And some old lady at the Caldwell County History Museum is going, what was this, 13 orders? We haven't sold that in 20 years. Um, and one of them was that weird redheaded guy that kept asking questions. <laughs> so, But... When you go through it, I highlighted guys in the 26. I just wrote what happened to them. You have entire neighborhoods, house after house after house. They're all dead. Then you get a guy that lives in the middle of it that survives. So imagine you go home. Yeah. And you look over at your buddy's house. He's not there anymore. You look over at that one. Oh, yeah, I remember that guy got killed at the wilderness. There's a reason these soldiers move after the war. Yeah. Yeah. And what you see with a lot of guys in the 26th North Carolina is they move, even if it's a county over, it's just enough distance. Yeah. And I think that's a telltale sign of the impact the war has on these guys. Right, right. Um, and so we, we often forget, I think, the human aspect of this battle. And, you know, and that's the thing that we always try to drive home. And, and I take it just from you making that point now that you guys do that on your show, too, is that these are human beings. Mm-hmm. And every death of a soldier reverberates through dozens of people back home and those lives are partially ruined by the end of the 20 uh, by the end of the battle of gettysburg from what i've been able to find and this is a low estimate because this is what i've been able to find 33 women became widows because of the battle of gettysburg just because of 26 north carolina mm. 84 children lost a father mm. that's a different way to look at the battle of gettysburg that guy got it? around yeah, well, you know, Bergen was a stud. Um, no. Uh, no, not but, 84 from yeah, one but, you know, father. You look at that, you know, you think about it, What if you did that for the entire Battle of Gettysburg? What if we viewed the casualties of this battle by the number of widows made yeah. and the number of children that lost a father? It's, you're in the hundreds of thousands. That gets, that gets real heavy real quick. Yes, it does. And I think we don't think about that. There is a ripple effect from these losses. It's not just the men that get killed, but what about the guy that loses both legs? Yeah. How do you plow a field with no legs? Right. What about a guy that loses his eyes? Or the the scars we don't see, mm-hmm. um, right? And then he goes home and kills his whole family, or beats his wife, or well, becomes an alcoholic. Civil War, or, yeah. There's a lot of evidence. Civil War <clears throat> veterans had higher rates of drug and alcohol abuse, higher rates of divorce, higher I rates of suicide. Totally believe Folks, it. This is not a new story for us no. in American history. No. And I think 
Human which, history. I mean, yeah. anywhere the, on on Earth at any time, that was a real thing that happened to soldiers. I mean, can you imagine being a career guy in the Roman Legion? No. That must be the most miserable. Like, I mean, you know, it, so all of these scars exist, and I mm -hmm. think that's why it, it depends on how you look at the battle. Mm -hmm. And I think what I always tell people, there is nothing glorious about this battle. It is a god-awful human tragedy. Yeah, it's just a... And I cringe, and I know why people say it, because they mean well, but when they say, you know, on the anniversary, we're celebrating the anniversary of Gettysburg. Right. I don't celebrate 11,000 deaths, folks. No. I don't celebrate 52,000 casualties. We will commemorate. We will remember. But we will not celebrate. Yes, I and, agree. And I think too much of the Civil War, there is ultimately a layer of celebration in this, which to me just, well, it's, it's there's a lot of things I don't like about the Civil War community, but that's another show for another time. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I would love to do that show. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. Like, uh, it, it's always weird to see people um, behaving like it's Memorial Day weekend at the beach, mm -hmm. which is another thing that bothers me. It's Memorial Day weekend and you're going to the beach instead of memorialing. But, you know, uh, but, yeah. you know, people are screwy. But so, uh, yeah. Did you want to add to that? Because uh, no, uh, Mike, Mike's got a, question, got a question here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were just talking about the human side mm -hmm. of this. Who were these men? Where did they come from? Mm -hmm. What did they do before the war? Can you shed some light? Because oftentimes we get lost in the numbers right. and we lose the human face of who these men were. And, and, and funny enough, I use numbers to humanize these men in my work. Um, I've got a number <laughs> of programs, a statistical look at the 26 North Carolina. 90% uh, of the men that were here at Gettysburg were from what I call the primary counties, eight counties provided the bulk of the men of the 26th North Carolina. 94% of the men of the 26th North Carolina here were born in North Carolina. So what this is already showing is most likely these men never left the state, and in many cases never left their home county until this war happens. Over 60% of them are farmers. If you add the other 25%, which were laborers, or listed as unskilled labor, most of those working some form of an agricultural experience. I think the tragedy is, statistically, they're not much that different than a regular Union regiment. If you look at the 24th Michigan, most of those guys are farmers. Right. They're the same guys. Well, the, the and, whole country was, even, the yeah. North, even though the North was more industrial, it was still an agrarian society, you the know, whole country. I always tell people, yeah, there's Chicago, there's Boston, there's New York, there's Philly. Go out. To the Midwest, there's a reason they call it the breadbasket of America mm -hmm. for a reason. Yeah, um, and yeah, you you. It was not really until the 20th century that most Americans started being employed by things other than agriculture. Right. So these guys come from three distinct regions of North Carolina. You have a section kind of where Virginia and Tennessee all connect with North Carolina. You get companies pulled from that area. You have two pulled from the Sand Hills region along the South Carolina border. And then you get some pulled from more or less what we would call today the Raleigh metro area, Wake County, Moore County, and Chatham County. So they're kind of, you have these little pockets that are all distinct. Which I think is kind of neat because you can. It's neat to look at different guys from different regions, see how things are different, and most of them are going to be not married. They're not the head of a household. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you also do get what I call the boys of '61, but you also get the men of '62. The average age of the 26 North Carolina here in the ranks is 26 years old. Interestingly enough, hmm. the average age of their company level officers is 24. Interesting. So you see those numbers here that when you start to look at it like that, wow, they're people. Yes, they've always been people. <laughs> but we sometimes assume they're not. Yeah. And, and I and you know, it's it's an interesting time to be studying Confederates. Oh, it is. It and is. what I always remind people is studying these individuals does not mean you support the cause of they were course. fighting for. It's not an endorsement. And at the end of the day, you also have to remember, no matter what cause they were fighting for, there's still a human heart beating inside of them. Yeah. They're still human beings. And, and they, people still love them. Yeah. And I they mean, loved people. So you have to kind of think about that. And yeah. that's why I think we have to be very careful when we start to kind of just make this war into a joke. Because believe me, it's easy to make fun of Southerners. I've made a living off of it as a native North Carolinian. And you're from the and South. I'm from the <laughs> South. I can do it, though. There's a difference. <laughs> that's right. Um, that's right. Well, you know, that you raise a good point because you remind me, you just reminded me, as soon as you said that, it popped in my head uh, that scene in Band of Brothers mm -hmm. when they're finally in Germany and uh, <clears throat> uh, Livingston, what, what, was his, what was his character's name? Um, Nixon. When, Nixon, thank you. Uh, Nixon Dick goes. Nixon? 
Dick, no, Dick Winters, Lewis, Lewis, Lewis Nixon. Nixon. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not, not Richard Nixon, the president. No. <laughs> um, the, uh, he goes into this, uh, you know, German woman's mm-hmm. home, beautiful home. And he's looking around in the parlor and gets some whiskey and looks at a picture of her husband. Mm-hmm. And you get, and like, there's a look that he gives almost like, obviously he's dead, the husband mm-hmm. and a look that he's just, like, there's just a look of like, this is so stupid. This is also mm-hmm. stupid. And what a shame because this is someone that is loved in this house mm-hmm. and he's gone. And, and I have to make the point, privates don't set national policy. Right. We might be better off if they did, yeah. but we don't live in that world. No. And we often have to sometimes disassociate the national aims of an army mm-hmm. to the individual aims. There were guys in the 26th North Carolina that were die hard, drank the Confederate Kool-Aid. They are gung-ho to kill some Yankees. Sure. There are also guys that were compelled to be there. Right. They had no other choice. Uh, there's guys that are going because everybody else in their town did. So everybody has their own reason why they're there. But they're all in this horrific situation together. Yeah. And I think we have to kind of think about that. It, it's easy to make fun of Confederates. But as I often make the point, no group came closer to dividing this country permanently than those idiot rednecks that everybody makes fun of all the yeah, time. Yeah, that's a good point. So keep yeah. that in mind. Yeah, no, that you do, you do bring up a good point there. And what do you think about when people say, yeah, but we have to remember they're all Americans. Or they'll say something like, or they're still Americans, guys. The 26 North Carolina, the letters I've read by 1861, 1862, 1863, they do not view themselves as Americans. Thank you. They are North Carolinians, they are, and they're secondary Confederates. They're right. North Carolinians first. Right. And so, yes, we, you know... Yes, they are all Americans, but they didn't view themselves as that. Right. And They're all Americans by virtue of being on the North American continent. And I would argue that shift for many Southerners came really between 1859 and the election of Abraham Lincoln, where they right. stopped viewing themselves as Americans. Yeah. And typically, when you look at civil wars, there is a point, usually before the first shots, where a large segment of the rebelling entity stops viewing themselves as part of what they're rebelling against. Mm-hmm. And that happens in the South. Mm-hmm. And it's scary because, as I say right now, we got a real 1850s vibe oh, going yeah. on in the country. Oh, yeah. So, it's, uh, so these are things that, as historians, sometimes living in modern times, a Civil War historian is pre- pretty miserable because you know how the story ends. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I agree. Like, it's, it's, uh, and, and, and it, you realize, you know, you hear people say, oh, scary times that we live in, mm-hmm. and they kind of just, you know, flippantly say that. But yeah. you're like, no, you don't realize how scary this really is. Like, and we are this close to killing each other. And I think that is, for many of these men, they came, you know, North Carolina is a very unique state mm-hmm. in that it's one of the very last to leave. They're really, they don't leave until after Fort Sumter. Mm. And it's Lincoln's call for 75,000 volunteers that finally compels North Carolina to leave. Right. And in many ways, they're sympathetic to the Confederacy, but they're not sympathetic enough to actually pitch in yet. Right. It's when they are being told by the President of the United States that you must send troops to put down this rebellion where they go, uh-uh. Right. We're not being coerced to do this. Uh-huh. And so there's a difference between, say, the lead up to the war in Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, to what you see in the, nor- in the upper South. Right. And that's why I say we have to be very careful when we kind of say all Confederates well, there's a vast distinction between soldiers from Mississippi and soldiers from North Carolina. Right. And, you, a, and people don't kind of see that. And, no. And you're not saying this as a defense of the Confederacy. Not at or, all. Yeah. I just want to be clear of that. Eric always, uh, our Eric, Eric Money here, he always brings up a good point that uh, when people say, yeah, but you know, they were still Americans. He's like, not for four years they weren't. No, they weren't. They didn't want to be Americans. Mm-hmm. And um, just because they're back in the fold, a lot of their descendants don't seem to still want to be Americans well, or something like that. And I think about what these men lived through. Think about what life was like in the American South in 1860. Go. Look at what life is like in the summer of 1865. Yeah. No region has ever had more profound change, cultural, political, economic change than what the South had in five years. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And before air, you talked about, you, you know, you don't like change. Yeah. People don't like change. Yeah. And, you know, they lost. That hurts. Yeah. Even though the cause was horrible, 
they still lost. Sure. And they come home to nothing. Oh, it's got to be the most devastating feeling on earth. And I even think about, you know, that kind of the way the army, well, I think one of the saddest accounts you read of the Civil War, the guys leaving Appomattox. Yeah. And they tell about how we initially were kind of in, in companies and then we were in squads because we realized if we have 10 guys showing up at a farm, they're not going to feed you. Right. But very soon, all these bonds that you had had for years. Gone. They just slowly dissipate. Because it's survival never, now. And you're never going to get that back. Yeah. Um, Isn't that strange? And you think about, too, in the South during Reconstruction, males were not allowed to congregate in large numbers because mm-hmm. they're worried they're going to get the band back together. Right. <laughs> well, what you want you're trying to process an event and you're around people that have no reference point to that event whatsoever. Mm-hmm. The people you need to talk to are the people you served with right? because they know what you went through. They, you don't have to explain it to them. You have to explain it to your wife or not. And she, and, and, and she'll never be able to understand. I mean, I have never been in not, combat. Yeah. I never try to understand what these individuals went through. Um, I've the, tried and I can't because there's no yeah. there's no thing on like when Eric tells me stories or when mm-hmm. uh, my friend Colby tells me stories and they get you know pretty graphic mm-hmm. and I, I mean it sounds horrific but I st- I don't get that feeling in my gut because I've never seen that I don't no. know what that is I, what what is that like uh, if you're listening with your kids and you don't want them to hear this I'll give you the count of three three two one earmuffs. What is it like, Eric Money, the producer, to see a man's testicles and penis plastered to a striker vehicle? Like, at that point, like, what goes on in your head? I mean, by the time that happened... You didn't care? No. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And, and I think you look at, I mean... Somebody well, that's counts. but that's a but that's a that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like that point, like well, he does it. If I saw that, if I walked out on Baltimore Street right now and a bomb blew up and the the bomber's uh, junk was stuck to a you know a FedEx mm-hmm. truck, I would probably go catatonic, and I I don't know if I would recover. But you know, but when you go through what Eric and millions of other mm-hmm. human beings throughout history have gone through, after a while, what's that quote from? Uh, I forget who says it, but it, uh, it's in, um, it might be uh, um, uh, Sam Watkins who says um, something about looking on uh, a dead man. He looks at it. It's mm-hmm. no different than looking on the corpse of a dog. And you read, and this is one of the things, one of the things that irks me as a historian, you can buy individual letters. You can go to any antique shop here in Gettysburg and buy a Civil War soldier's letter. Mm-hmm. The problem is that was once part of a collection mm-hmm. of letters. Mm-hmm. And I believe it is absolutely historical malfeasance whenever these letter collections get broken up yeah. for profit. Oh, yeah. Which really irks me. Sure. Uh, because you can't tell a story, a soldier's experience, unless you have all of it. Right. And on the ones that we do have, what's very interesting is read the first time they write home about their first battle. A lot of detail. Yeah. They go on and on and on. But by 63, 64, they'll just write, yeah, we're in a battle today. Yeah. Because the letter now is not telling the folks at home what you're experiencing, this novelty for many of these men. What it's now telling you is, I'm using this letter as an escape. Yeah. I want to know what's on the farm. Right. I want to know how the crops are doing. I don't want to think about my existence here. And, and I think we see that shift. And you also, some of the more tragic things, when you read a guy that had in his letters a very you know, good sense of humor, kind of an upbeat guy, and you read his letters a year later, and you can just tell he's been beaten down by yeah. the floor. What's that, uh, it's Angelo Crapsy? Do you ever read, um, what is it, Pathway to Hell, Eric? Is that the name yeah. of the book? Yeah. Do you ever read that? Mm-mm. Pathway to Hell? It, it, it goes mm-hmm. into that. It's like, what was it, a psychiatrist or something that, that wrote the book or, mm-hmm. or did like studied his letters? Mm-hmm. And you could see his decline. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's sad. It's yeah. sad to see because he was all like whoop de doo, gung ho in the beginning. And then, you know. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of terrible stuff posted historically on the internet, but every now and then there's some good stuff. Mm-hmm. And one of the more telling things I ever saw, someone posted a side-by-side photo of a German soldier from World War I in 1914. Mm-hmm. Looks like this nice, good-looking 18-year-old kid. And then you see him in 1918. Mm-hmm. The guy looks 50. Yeah. That's what the war did to him. Sure. Physically. It ages you. Not just what it does to you, everything else. Right. And Uh, So I think we don't, I think we have to view these individuals as human beings. 
Well, yeah. And if we don't, we're doing it wrong. I agree. And and I think the numbers often throw us off. And, and I often urge people on tours, go to the Pennsylvania Monument and just read a couple names. When's the last time somebody thought about that guy? Mm. They're all dead. They're all dead. <laughs> you know, who was the last person to actually think about that individual? Yep. And you may know nothing about them. Who, you know, who knows if he's from the 73rd Pennsylvania or Company E, whatever. Just read their name. Mm-hmm. And think a moment what they went through and their experience in this war. I think it will change your perspective. And, and I think we have to be, in many ways, I, I find myself constantly in awe of Civil War soldiers. Yeah. And it's interesting when you deal with the public day in and day out as they're experiencing history. I don't think there's anybody who has a better finger on the pulse of the visiting historic public than licensed battlefield guides. Right. I, I think agree. we have a better sense than even the Park Service. Oh, I absolutely with agree with that. Yeah. Um, it'd be nice if they listen to us, but <laughs> I agree with that either too. Or, either or, but but I think what you see is that people they want they want to try to connect to this. They want to try to get a sense of this, and when you bring it to the human side, they get it. Mm-hmm. If you just say fifty-two thousand casualties, okay, what's that? Well, it's the size of the football stadium where I went to college, right? But I mean, everybody's been in a football stadium. Everybody's been in a football stadium, <laughs> so you, you know, can understand um, that. Eleven thousand dead. That's basically the end zone that they filled in where I went to college. Yeah, and I think about that in a sold-out game. Everybody that's in the stadium is going to be a casualty. Yeah. No, you can't and, imagine that. And, and even when hard. you have that visual, even if somebody tells you that while you're sitting in a football stadium that's packed, mm-hmm. you still can't imagine what that looks like yeah. spread out over miles of, of fields and well, hills. And You know, I tell people on tours, if you want to know what 100,000 people looks like, watch a Penn State football game. Mm-hmm. Watch a University of Tennessee football game. Watch an Ohio State football game. When they're playing at home, that's 100,000 people in those stadiums. That's, crazy. that's the Army of the Potomac, folks. Yeah. Like, that's amazing. That's, it, those that's where I think you know history you can connect people in any number of ways but I think when you try to bring it down to its most basic element people want to understand the experience of other humans mm-hmm. and there's a lot of things that we share with these soldiers a lot of things where they're totally different and I always kind of cringe when they, oh they were just like us they were not just like us no um, just like the people of the 1950s were not just like us right. um, in certain ways in certain ways everybody, but there's but, also differences yeah. and you have to kind of understand that too sure but, but I think what, what I look at, I've often viewed myself, I don't consider myself a military historian. I am a social historian that actually studies soldiers. Okay. I view regiments as a microcosm of the society that they're from, for better or worse. Yeah. And so it's kind of a different way of looking at things. So I often joke, I'm, you know, I'm too school for cool and too cool for school. You know, I'm not, I mean, this weird <laughs> historical area. Uh, but, but I think that's where I wish we would see more look at these guys themselves yeah their societies they're from that's what's important the the what's that doesn't interest me the why's and how interest me mm-hmm. uh, even for you know i i'm more interested in the command decisions than actually what happens uh, me too I like to know I, the thought process yes me too and, i like that too and so it's you know that's why i say you know you could have had any number of guides up here and they might say it totally different which is the great thing with interpreting history you bring your own kind of take to exactly. it exactly which i always say don't take the same guide every time unless no. it's me because <laughs> um, you know I, I need the money yeah, um, yeah. but um I got, I got a dog and two cats to feed uh, so well maybe you should finish that damn book and then you make some more money well i've got to be out there to work um, you know, I would, if anybody would like to underwrite me and give me a couple thousand dollars i'll, I'll get the book out in a year if somebody right. gives me the money to do it yeah it's Somebody, um, if somebody can give them like you know, let's some, some reason. What's a reasonable number? Forty thousand, and then you could take the year off. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that's I, what I you make. Say ten grand, but if you want to give me 40, well, if I'm you cool could, that, if too, you could stretch uh, ten grand out a year, yeah. I'm saying they 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 set you up so that you have yeah. nothing else to do but your book. Right. How much would it cost? I mean, minimum the oh minimum gosh. it would cost. For me to not work it for a year? For you to not work at guiding for a year. I mean, you could if you wanted to take an occasional yeah. one, but your sole purpose is to finish the damn book or turn it I into mean, a it, podcast or it, whatever. It would essentially have to offset what I make exactly. a year. Yeah. So, and people forget that. that you know, well, I'm not, okay. when, you're, when you're a professional historian, yeah. there are very few professional historians that all they get to do is work on a single thing. 
Yes. Whether you work at the park service, you're a professor, you're a site manager, whatever you're doing, you have other things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I always love when people are like, when's the podcast coming out? Whenever I get around to it, folks. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. It's, yeah, right. We There's, have jobs. We have you, other things we have to do. And that so, was, uh, that was, yeah, that is, you're absolutely right. Like, I, when I did started this one, I was like, I have to find a way to not have to find a job. Mm-hmm. And I did. Luckily, I got lucky. Uh, but uh, that's why most podcasts eventually fail because yeah. you can't keep up with it because you've got real life to deal with. And real life's important, folks. <laughs> real life trumps podcasts. Yeah, well, so. it's in your face. Yeah. You know? And so sometimes you can't avoid it and you got to take care of and it. And also, when I started this project with the book, podcasts really weren't a thing. No, they weren't. I mean, it wasn't they really. Were, they were very so new. It, and I am as much kind of kind of like a little feather floating around that you know you you, ch- you have to change if you don't update with the times you're going to become irrelevant that's absolutely right and, and so and options that I did not have when I started this 10 years ago are different today mm-hmm. also I know more about the 26 North Carolina today than I did 10 years ago right so I go back and I look at things I'm like that was horrible that was a horrible interpretation I need to change that so but that's good see that's good though because you're uh, you're not just getting it out there to get it out there yeah you're you're actually taking the time to make sure that you do it well mm-hmm. and and that's respectable because there's so there's there's so many books that come out where it's mm-hmm. just like this guy just put a book out. How is there another book by this guy? Well, when you have people doing the research for you, that makes it easier. <laughs> well, I'm um, well, you know I, I mean you still have to analyze it, but I think there's yeah you. I will say I mean there are some authors that are incredibly prolific and God bless them. I'm not one of them, mm-hmm. and I never will be one of them. But uh, yeah, I think it takes time to understand a subject. Yeah. You don't just get it immediately. No. And it's the same thing with this battle. You know, I didn't just wake up one day and knew what I know about the Battle of Gettysburg. No. Nobody it's, does. I've been studying this battle since I was six years old. Mm-hmm. I've been studying it 33 years. You know, I might be 39, but it's still 33 years. Sure. And so I think that's why I say, you know, people often say, where do you start? Well, just the start beginning. anywhere. Yeah. Just pick somewhere. The movie. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> you, know, call it 20, you know, actually, the 26 does make an appearance in the movie. Do they? Think about the July 3rd scene. They recreate the Arnold's battery putting double canister into them. It's very yeah. brief, but okay. the 26th North Carolina is in the movie. Yeah. So it's completely inaccurate, but they're in the movie. I also so. realized I was just reading uh, yesterday about um, Caliph mm-hmm. uh, riding down to Purgle section and he stops and there's Buford on his horse smoking a pipe. Um, and uh, they have a, a little exchange, and then a shell goes off, and their horses rear up. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, wait, there's kind of that scene in the mm-hmm. movie. Not exactly, but a shell goes <laughs> off, and Buford is... No, no, it's not Buford, is it? It's Gamble. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's Gamble. Okay, never mind. Gamble's down, sir. Yeah. You know? And he's like, I'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which to me, I was like, ah, crap, my hip. You know, this hurts. <laughs> um, the soil in Virginia is softer. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I think that's where there's any number of things that will get people interested in history. Yeah. And, and I think so you start somewhere. And for me, I didn't just start researching the 26th North Carolina. My, mm-hmm. My path kind of led me there. And my first book that I wrote, the first Confederate killed in this very obscure battle was a guy named Noah F. Muse of the 5th North Carolina Cavalry. His brother, Ashley Muse, was killed in the 26th North Carolina here at Gettysburg, buried somewhere along the Chambersburg Pike by his best friend, Albert Fry. Hmm. There's the real life of war. Yeah. The Muse family has four sons. They lose all four of them within a year and a half. God, can you imagine? So those are things like that, that um, things will lead you in certain directions. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's, I've always been fascinated by North Carolina troops, the North Carolinian. Sure. Uh, Gettysburg, obviously, if you're going to write about anybody from North Carolina at Gettysburg, you go up to 26. And also, part of what I'm doing is trying to get the history right. Because unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that's been written about the 26th North Carolina is, well, I'll say it, it's wrong. Oh, shot across the bow. And so, you know, Covered with Glory is a good read. But it's There's got some, some mistakes, issues. really. Um, Lee's Tar Heels, which is on the brigade, which has a chapter on Gettysburg, good book, 
got some things wrong. Okay. And this is why you keep writing, you keep research. I hope one day someone's going to read my book and go, oh man, that Lindblade guy got that totally wrong. Yeah. Well, I hope that you went and researched and found out why, because that's great, because in the day we know more. Right. And then and you go write your own damn book for 10 e- years. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, that's where we build upon what we have. Yes. And, but, but I think, you know, even Covered with Glory, I was in high school when that came out. I graduated in 2001. Mm, okay. So this book is, the book is legally able to drink now. <laughs> I think it's okay to be able to, you know, reassess things after 21 years. Sure. Of you know? course. And you could have done it after 21 days if you wanted to. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, there's no, you know. Wait, is that called rehab? <laughs> That's 28 days. <laughs> oh, okay. I've never been. I'm not a quitter. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> so, but. All right. Well, listen, Blade, uh, this has been very interesting. We need to take a break, and then we need to come back and read the questions. Yes, listener questions. Listener questions, and then we're going to fill in any blanks that we might have left out here. Um, we're nearing uh, two hours uh, before we take our break, which is uh, odd. Normally, we do it at about an hour. So Yeah, I'll just insert it in somewhere. No, no. We're inserting it right now, so we'll be right back ladies and gentlemen hey folks you know one of the most popular episodes on our patreon feed isn't even about the battle of gettysburg no it's actually about the battle of the little bighorn the battle of the little bighorn rivals gettysburg as the most written about and debated battle in american history if you ever wanted a chance to visit or revisit this iconic battlefield in southeastern montana then now is your chance Join historian and friend of the show, James Hessler, on his annual Little Bighorn Tour. This year's travel dates are August 31st through September 5th of 2022. You will follow Custer's route to the battlefield, see where the fight opened in the Little Bighorn Valley, and visit key battlefield landmarks such as Reno Hill, Weir Point, and Last Stand Hill. While touring the field, you will debate all the many controversies that continue to surround Custer and this battle. This is a great opportunity to see one of the most pristine and historic battlefields in the country. Those dates again are August 31st through September 5th, 2022. And for more details, email Jim at Custer7 at Comcast.net. That's Custer, the numeral 7, at Comcast.net. Put Little Bighorn 2022 addressing Gettysburg in the subject line. But don't delay. This trip will book up very soon. For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savis Beatty, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Gettysburg, a nation divided, is an award-winning mixed reality mobile application using augmented reality technology. It transports users into the most crucial moments in the Battle of Gettysburg, the turning point of the Civil War. Users can listen and watch historic figures share their stories as lifelike animated avatars, traverse 360-degree image sequences of the battlefield. Its cinematic battle sequences are narrated by actor Scott Eastwood. The mobile app is available for free on iOS and Android. It's designed to be used anywhere. At home, at school, at the park, or at Gettysburg National Military Park. It uses GPS to help guide you through your journey to see the stories and events unfold at the exact location where they occurred. So go into your phone's app store and get it now for free. That's Gettysburg, a nation divided. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our sutlery at addressinggettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to addressinggettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's addressinggettysburg.com slash shop. What do Gettys Bike Tours customers say? Very family friendly. We had a wonderful time with our son. Me and my friends were able to 
uh, rent these bikes and go at our own pace. So we were able to just do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. And I highly recommend it to anybody else. It seemed like the right way to go to view the, the wonderful sites and also get an incredible amount of history from Bob. Our tour guide Bruce was so knowledgeable about the facts and the history of these battlefields that I came away with an understanding uh, that was unmatched by any other means. The breeze on the battlefield made up for the hot day. I had a wonderful time, uh, great trip, lots of history, um, wonderful bike ride, perfect weather. Could have asked for a nicer day. Uh, highly recommended. Uh, if you're going to tour Gettysburg, I would recommend doing it on the bike. It's a lot of fun. I loved it. It was awesome. Um, we really couldn't stump the professor with any of our questions, so uh, we, we thought it was really well worth it. It was an excellent day out and got you outside and experienced the weather. Beautiful weather out here today. We had a lot of fun. If you're thinking about it, I'd just say give it a shot. It was awesome for us. I hope it's awesome for you guys too. Go to Gettysbike.com or call 717-752-7752 to book a battlefield experience you will never forget. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Did you say Abe Lincoln? And we are back with uh, Eric Lindblade. That was uh, Gary Edelman there uh, saying, did you say Abe Lincoln? Um, and uh, it's time for your questions, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget to be uh, someone who gets to send in a question. You have to be a patron over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. All of these people are our beloved patrons, and they want to talk to Eric Lindblade today. But they can't. I can. So here's what they would say if they were here. Balthazar is going to open us uh, up tonight, and he says, well, let me rephrase that. Is that his that. real name? <laughs> no. Okay. That's his nickname, I think, because uh, because the name that I, I can't remember what his real name is, but the name that came in on the email was different than that. Well, because I've long had this thing where there's names that nobody uses anymore. Right. When you study Civil War soldiers, you, they have, like, I want to meet an Archibald. Yeah. Well, here's a Balthazar. Yeah, so now, that kind of sounds like a cool name. But he, yeah, it's it's uh, his last name is something like that, but it's not. So it sounds to me like that's just a nickname people started giving him. Well, you know, not based everybody on can have name. a cool last name. No, no, like Lindblade. Yeah, exactly. And then people can just call you the Blade. Yeah. Was the 26 North Carolina wearing North Carolina uniforms or Richmond Depot uniforms in June, July, 1863? And how did the book Covered with Glory change the narrative of the first day's fight? Well, the first question, the 26th North Carolina was pretty well equipped in the Gettysburg campaign. Now, keep in mind, they're not seeing hard service. You would have, we know before the campaign, they do get new uniforms in Richmond. Some of them do, at least. Uh, Thomas Parrott of Company G talks about as they're crossing the Potomac, he says, we were all decked out in our most splendid uniforms. So probably you would have had a mixture of type two jackets. You would have probably had for some of the guys that came in in 62, while they're still in North Carolina, still some North Carolina gear there. But there's a lot more uniformity to Confederates than we sometimes want to give them credit for. Mm. We like to think of them as all being ragtag, barefoot. There's a little more uniformity to them, at least by 63. I mean, 64, 65, it's getting tough. But it was mostly Richmond Depot jackets, but you would have had some mixture of North Carolina jackets here or there, probably guys that came in late 61, 62, that might still have them. Mm. But the bulk of them were wearing Depot jackets. All right. And then uh, cover with glory. I don't know if it really changed the narrative. Um, I think it certainly highlighted the 26 North Carolina. Uh, that was originally published by an imprint of Random House. Hmm. So that's a pretty big publisher. I mean, yeah. It's a nationally published book on the 26 North Carolina. So it certainly got the name out there. And it gave, I think, a little bit more humanity to them. I mean, whatever quibbles I have as a historian with the work, it created attention. Right. So it certainly made my job a lot easier sure. coming after, because right. um, it also gave me a, f a base to look at what accounts he used. And then I go and look at them myself, or I eventually find things he wasn't using. Mm -hmm. um, but it really didn't change the narrative that much. In a lot of respects, the kind of same narrative between the 24th Michigan and the 26th North Carolina has been existing since really 1907. Okay. Pretty much any work on the 26th North Carolina uses Underwood's work. Every book that came out since about the Iron Brigade uses his book. So it's kind of this regurgitation, the same story, which kind of is what Gregg does in his book. It's kind of just an extended version of, of Underwood. So what I kind of said was, well, let's just look at it from a different perspective. So as I say, it's a very well-written book. There's some good things in it. 
But like anything, don't take it as gospel. Now, and the, I would say that for my book as well. Sure. Uh, for the people that are listening who uh, have no idea the names that you just said, Greg mm-hmm. and Underwood, uh, who are they? Which ones did so they So George Underwood was at one time an assistant surgeon in the 26th North Carolina and later writes the official history of them. Okay. Uh, there is a collection of... There was a judge in North Carolina by the name of Walter Clark. He was a Confederate veteran. After the war, he wanted to get a history of every North Carolina unit that served during the war. So what he did was he corresponded with other officers, and they would write their history. Some are better than others. In this case, he ends up contacting George Underwood, who at least is the name on it, but most likely it was written by John Lane and William Bergwin, at least large chunks of it. Okay. So... That's what's been kind of passed through. And then Covered of Glory was written by Rod Gregg, uh, who's written a number of books on the Civil War. Uh, so, you know, a lot of it gets carried over. And that's one thing I always stress to folks. It's not so much what's written on the pages. It's what's in their notes. Mm. Look at their notes. Look at where they're getting their information from. That's how you judge if a book is good or not. Right. It's not the writing. Right. Believe me, plenty of historians have bamboozled folks with good writing. Yeah. And it's lousy history. Right. Um, and conversely, there's been a lot of people that have great history and are horrible writers. Mm-hmm. So, as I say, look at the notes first. Look at where they're getting their information. And, and that gives you a good starting point. And for me, it was, I looked, sometimes I think for historians, we need to ask ourselves, what don't we know? Rather than what we know. Mm-hmm. Go to any bar here in town on a Friday night. And you get so many bar stool historians wanting to show how much they know. Yeah, I would like people to go. You know what? This is what I don't know, and that's kind of how I start at the twenty six. What questions could I not have answered? Yeah. from what was out there, and that's what guided my research. And, and I think that's a very good way to approach things. Like that's the way I approach all this. Is like I'm a student, so you, licensed battlefield guide Eric Lindblade, teach me. Mm-hmm. You know, for free. And then, and then see how I just bamboozled yeah. you into doing I, I this got for free. Again. Yeah. <laughs> no. So I, I think that's a good way to because uh, it's it's a humble approach, mm-hmm. um, but I think you, you you'll probably find things out that you wouldn't have found out if you just stuck with what you knew. Well, I'll admit I could not do what you're doing right now. I have a hard time asking people questions. Oh, oh, oh. Like I, I like having a more kind of interview set. Yeah. Thing. I'm not good at that. My I kind of gather information more by just having a conversation. Well, that's what I'm doing. Get, well, what I'm saying is you're, you're a great interviewer, by the way. Well, thank you. I mean, that's, Thank you very much. I don't have those skills. I would rather just have a conversation with somebody, and I'll eventually figure out what I want to figure out through the conversation or mm-hmm. just see where it goes. But I've always approached history as what I don't know. Because if all you're doing is reading history of what you know, it's not fun. No, it gets old. Like, you know how the movie ends. Right. Like, for me, I, I wonder what don't I know, and that's what builds on what I research. Yeah. And I wish more historians of this battle would ask that, rather than spending so much time showing how much they know. Because believe me, end of the day, nobody cares what you know on Facebook, folks. Oh, thank it's you for like saying that. What yes. you, it's how you approach your craft. It's how you approach being a historian. It's not just being able to regurgitate information. It's being able to analyze. It's being able to give it meaning. Analyze. That's the difference. And you know, I got I to gotta, uh, uh, brag on my friend Mike Lentz over here, uh, because um, last night we, we were having a conversation and I was telling him about something I'm writing and, and where I've, I got up to. I had writer's block for mm-hmm. a year and I, and I finally broke yesterday. And so I was telling him, here's what I've been doing and here's how I'm going to jump back and forth in the story and all that stuff. And he goes, you ought to include this episode with this and that and the other thing and everything. And But as he's telling me about all these things, he's throwing in an analysis. And, and, like, mm-hmm. and I think... That is what makes a guide great Mm -hmm. and a historian. But for guides, that's what makes a guide great is that he's able to explain. And it's one thing to rattle off facts, Mm -hmm. but to then put it in terms that would make someone understand the why of things Mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes the how of things. um, That's that's a talent. And or it's a gift or something. And uh, and and he's got it. See, this is a guy right over here, Mike Lentz, Six Questions Lentz. This is a guy who's going to take the guide exam and pass the first time all the way through. I'm telling you. Wow, you just set that guy up. <laughs> Man. Uh, 
<laughs> you know, that, that's like saying the first guy off the landing craft in D-Day is going to get to the beach first. <laughs> yeah, you are. Uh, thank, but, thank you, Babe Ruth, for calling the shot. Yeah. Actually, speaking of that, famous Cleveland Indian catcher Jake Taylor did that uh, as well. So he called a shot against the Yankees. But he didn't hit a home run. He actually laid down a drag bunt, which allowed Willie Mays Hayes to come around and score. It's a great oh, moment yes. in Indians history. Great moment. Yeah, great exactly. Moment. I, I the, remember. The pre- I cherish that childhood the memory. The premier moment in Indians history. When, when I feel yeah. bad, I just wrap myself in that warm memory. So. <laughs> that's funny because I don't, we didn't we didn't talk about that. That was during the break. We talked about Tom Berger. Yeah, I know, that's I mean, why I did it. Yeah, I want but people to be confused. But that was great <laughs> because for us it was hilarious because <laughs> you you just made an allusion to. It. All right, we we need to we need to keep going here because we got more. That's Joe, what twenty six said. <laughs> we gotta keep going because uh, we got more. We got more. <laughs> keep shooting. We'll make more. Joe DeFuria says, was it the rank and file or the leadership that resulted in the 26th North Carolina slugging it out with the Iron Brigade rather than moving more aggressively, advancing as a veteran re- veteran regiment might have? Well, I kind of touched on it a little earlier. I would argue they did advance as a veteran regiment because yeah. they were a veteran regiment. Right. They just didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, you know, I mean, the cow going through the slaughter pen would love to go somewhere, but he can't. It's a slaughter <laughs> pen for a reason. Right. And, you know, we talk about the famous slaughter pen here at Gettysburg. Well, in many ways, you have a a version of a slaughter pen on July 1st. And I think what allows the 26th North Carolina to function the way they did was because of the quality of their leadership and the quality of their soldiers. Green units don't do that. Mm-hmm. Even well-trained veteran units don't always do that. Right. The 26 did. And I think that's a testament to not only the field level officers, the company level officers, but also a really great core of non commissioned officers, which we don't really talk about enough in the Civil War, but non commissioned officers were critical for these units. It's what holds them together. Yeah. And so I wish there'd be a lot more analysis done of company officers and non commissioned officers. I mean, everybody talks about colonels and majors. Sure. Everybody talks about captains and lieutenants, and they play a role too. Sure. So, yeah. So, no, I, I would, I would, you know, with all due respect to the to the, to the question, I I would say they have, they did function like a veteran unit at Gettysburg because they were, mm-hmm. and and they certainly, I think, their performance not only on July first. But what they also do on July third, yeah, they come back. So yeah, that that's, that's I mean, the scene of a veteran unit. As whenever we talk about Buford's part in the fight, Buford's cavalry's part in the fight uh, with Tim Smith, he uh, always goes, "Yeah, but it wasn't really that big of a deal because they only had like you know like a handful of casualties mm-hmm. and few of them were killed, and it wasn't really hard fighting." And you could look at the 26th North Carolina and say the absolute opposite of that. Mm-hmm. It was hard fighting. If you if you base it solely on casualties, mm-hmm. it was hard fighting. Right. And those guys did some hard fighting. And I would argue in the in the story of McPherson's Ridge, yes, the 26th North Carolina suffers such heavy casualties. But their role, I would argue, is maybe even less important than, say, the 52nd North Carolina. You Why is out, that? You don't outflank Biddle. Things get a lot tougher for you. Okay. So this is where I think sometimes there's a, an idea we tend to kind of focus in on certain units. I think you got to look at the total picture. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the little round top syndrome. Mm. Chamberlain did his job on little round top. Patrick O'Rourke <laughs> did his job on right. little round top. Governor K. Warren yep. did his job. Strong Vincent. If one of those doesn't do their job, we might be talking about something totally different. And what we see is. Casualties don't always equal effectiveness. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, William Barksdale's brigade suffered fifty percent losses at Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. What did they really accomplish? Not much. I mean, they opened up the peach orchard, but then what? Right. I mean, you can argue at least the twenty. They took the road. You know, well, it's a nice road. <laughs> but it, you know, you think about the twenty-six North Carolina. They drove back almost an entire Union brigade. Right now, of course, there's a size of a brigade. Almost, right, but they do that. There's at least something to show for it. And I'm a, you know, there's a lot of guys in any conflict that die for no reason. Sure. So I think if there's at least going to be casualties, at least have it lead to something. <laughs> you know, there's nothing sadder than the guys that just went over the top and nothing was accomplished but casualties. And unfortunately, that's sometimes the reality. In but war. that's that's war. You and, have to take that think, gamble. You know, and I would also take nothing away from the Iron Brigade. I'll make a lot of jokes about the Iron Brigade, mostly because everybody just talks about them all the time. Right. So I like to. I'm the person that likes to go to the other team's stadium and boo against the home team. Sure. That's fun. <laughs> um, I don't do it in Philly though because they'd kill me. No, that's uh, yeah. You got to know where you're. Yeah. you're where but you're you know, doing you know, in like Toronto, 
They the Canadians care. are really nice. They, yeah, they're know. very nice. They're like, sorry we're beating you. Oh, I appreciate that, guys. You're great. I yeah. love Canada. They're still going to beat you, yeah. but they'll apologize with each punch. Which is nice. It is nice. You know? That is nice. Brian Duranick says, uh, while it could be said that the ultimate responsibility would be with Lee, can you discuss the administrative breakdown and communication that occurred in which a unit such as the 26th, which was so battered on July 1st, was allowed to participate in the afternoon attack on July 3rd with whom? would the responsibility for such a mistake lie? Well, let me ask you this first, uh, Eric. Is it, is it a mistake? Well, I mean, ultimately, the person responsible is Robert E. Lee. Right. Lee decides which divisions and which brigades are going to be in this attack. Mm-hmm. Now, there is an account of Lee riding down Seminary Ridge on July 3rd, and he looks to one of his staff officers, and he looks at a group of men, a lot with bandages, what we would consider walking wounded. Right. And Lee says something along the lines of, whose regiment is that? And his officer, and the staff officer says, sir, that's Scales' brigade. And Lee says something along the lines of, they should not go into the fight. Well, guess what? They went into the fight. Sure. And, and I think there is a, I think partially it's because the Confederates did not do a good enough job of getting real-time information. Mm-hmm. I mean, as we talked about earlier, Lee kind of cooks the books a little bit. That's great for a newspaper in Richmond. It's a lot harder when you need to know exactly how many men of your army you have available yeah. and in what condition. Yeah. Uh, Lee is also more of a hands-off commander. That plays a role of it. Um, so I don't know if we'd really say fault. It's, they're just, that's where they were in the line. Right. Um, you have other units in that area that didn't get included. Um, and also, we, we need to remember, yes, the 26th suffered horribly. Yes, the 11th North Carolina suffered horribly. But the 47th North Carolina, the 52nd, not so bad. Hmm. So that's still a brigade that is at least functioning. Right. Which there were only a handful of those around. And so because your question is, where do you put the 26th? I mean, where do you allocate your forces? Do you need to use them to break through, or are you going to use them for the follow-up? Mm-hmm. Well, there's advantages to which. And you know, it was once said, success has a thousand fathers, but failure is an orphan. Right. And I think we can kind of nitpick this. I, I think, frankly, Lee had no idea the condition of the 26th North Carolina. And, and I would also argue that's not his job to know the condition of the 26th North Carolina. Correct. Uh, so I think it's a lot more, yes, there's a lot of things administratively, but you know, I think Lee is trying to put together the best force he can. And also keep in mind, Lee's throwing that plan together in about two hours. Mm. So yeah. there's not a lot of time to really analyze the numbers. So. So I don't know if I really answered it directly, but there's a lot of things to kind of consider there. But that's the answer. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tim Matthews, he says, what is your honest assessment of how much time it took on July 1st for the 26th to get from Willoughby's run to the vicinity of present day South Reynolds Avenue? Mm-hmm. Well, they don't get to if they're at South Reynolds, they're not well, what is today South Reynolds um, because none of the park roads were here in 1863. Right. Um, or you would argue that's why they were here, because uh, there was a battle here. So that's where they had to fight. But you you look at this, and they will. what I use is the edge of Herbst Woods. Okay. 30 minutes at most. That's start to finish. That's leaving Pettigrew's Woods and now being again at the edge of Herbst Woods, which is really only about a mile. Okay. So, so walking in there and then, uh, and then, and all the fighting you're saying too is taking a half an hour? Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is all very quickly. I always done. describe this fight as incredibly short and incredibly brutal. Yeah. And that's really the way a lot. I mean, if we would look at the 26, we'd say they were fighting for 12 hours. You would and think. And they lost that. People go, okay, I can rationalize yes. that. How do you rationalize 650 casualties in 30 minutes? I don't know how you can. I don't think you can. And so I think that's, we have to sometimes look at the numbers and length of this fighting. Most of the Battle of Gettysburg, except for a handful of cases, typically is 20, 30, 45 minutes. What uh, what did you say earlier that they were, what, 40 paces apart? 20 to 40 paces. 20 to 40 paces. Mm -hmm. That's not very far. What I would just say, if you want to know what that is, go outside your front yard. If weather's accommodating, like, you know, there's like a tornado, don't go outside yeah, don't right do now. That. And also, if there's a tornado, why are you listening to a podcast? Watch the freaking weather. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, well, if you're going to die, die happy, I guess. Yeah, right. So, exactly. but go outside and just step off. Your first step count is one. Your second step count is two. And go all the way to 20. Mm-hmm. 
And then imagine there is a line of infantry there and you are where you started from and you're blazing away at each other. It's ridiculously close. Yeah. It's, um, it's so it's, it's a wonder all of them didn't kill each other. Like, I mean, yeah. like they're both. Uh, well, yeah. It also shows for if there is a saving grace, these were not marksmen. Yeah. Civil War soldiers are not trained to be marksmen on the whole. I mean, you have specialized units, but not. I mean, today, if you had a well, you would not have a similar you, fight today. No, Nobody's wouldn't. doing linear tactics. But if you had, say, a, a unit that was well trained as marksmen going up against another unit in the same way, it. It would not. Hit, it would have been an absolute bloodbath. Sure, it was an absolute bloodbath, and there were still a lot of rounds that were missed. I mean, we estimate in the Battle of Gettysburg around seven million projectiles were fired in the three days. There's fifty-two thousand casualties. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, not pretty. every casualty is killed or wounded. So you know, this idea that Southern boys can shoot better than everybody else—that's just yeah, that's bogus. Because I can guarantee you, those guys from the backwoods of Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota, they're every bit as outdoorsmen as anybody from the South. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because, as we said before, the whole country, save for the major cities, was agrarian. Yeah. So why, you know, the old uh, myth of you know uh, Confederates were better shooters and horsemen because they grew up shooting, hunting, and riding horses, but don't people in the country in the north ride horses and shoot and hunt? And also the reality is, by the 1860s, there were very rare occasions where you were hunting to feed your family. Yeah. If you're having to hunt to feed your family, you're, things have gone horribly wrong. <laughs> like dirt poor. Because you, there's a reason we have, well, agriculture. Yeah. There's a right. reason we have animal husbandry. Right. I just love that term. It um, is a strange term. It's a good term. term. Yeah. But, you know, there's a reason we have that. The idea that you have farms and animals is so that you don't have to go out and hunt and gather your food. Right. You can do it to augment what you have. But the idea that these guys are going out every day and shooting, there's also a difference between shooting a deer and shooting another human being. Mm-hmm. That's also shooting back. Bambi is not armed, folks. Right. You know, and so there's a difference there. And so, you know, a lot of that goes back to early Civil War propaganda. I mean, you know, t- you know, one Reb can whip 10 Yankee hirelings. And, and you see it on both sides. Sure. And what it really shows to me is that both sides were incredibly naive about what they're about to get into. And but but I think what we look at in that fighting, there is a lot packed in to that 30 to possibly at most 45 minutes, but I think it's probably closer to 30 minutes. That's remarkable when you when you put that time limit on it there, uh, or that time frame on it, it, it makes it even more horrifying. And, and we do that, you know, I think I've done that when I do Pickett's Charge on any tour. You know, if we mm-hmm. do a bus tour, we have to make a bathroom stop midway through, and usually that's about 50 minutes into the tour. Right. So what I usually make the argument, Pickett's Charge more or less is 50 minutes. Mm. So I'll say, all right, we left at 11 o'clock. When we made our bathroom stop, it was 11.50. That's Pickett's Charge, folks. Yeah. That's it. The length of the tour is two hours. That's roughly the bombardment. Yeah. You know, and people, when they look at it in those terms, they go, oh, wow. And because we don't really have a sense of time. No. Soldiers did not have a sense of time. And, and, and I also, if I was in the Iron Brigade, I am sure every second seemed like minutes. Every hour seemed like days. Um and so, yeah, I think we have to, there's a tendency for us to think because the higher casualties they were fighting all day. Just in this case, it was short and brutal. And they're probably at the edge of Herbst Woods. I said probably 30, 35 minutes at most 45. Eric, uh, the producer, um, you've been in firefights. Um, do you lose time in that? Like, is that, is that a common thing? Uh, <sighs> I, you lose, uh, you lose the concept of time. Hmm. Like it, it, it doesn't. I couldn't tell you how long any of the firefights that I was in actually lasted. Mm-hmm. Right. It, it felt like a long period of time. It might have been five minutes. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't really know. Like, you well, just there's, there's a lot to process. And the last thing you're doing is checking your watch. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Well, <laughs> and also, I mean, I have an account from the 19th Indiana that said they held the Confederates across Willoughby's run for an hour. Hmm. Yeah, they didn't. <laughs> but it might sure have felt like an hour. Right. Um, and, and also keep in mind, there is no standardized time in the Civil War. I'm sure if we all looked at our phones right now, we all pretty much are within two or three minutes of each other. Everybody hold up your phone. What does it say? I have 652. That's what I have, 652. There we go. Okay. On the button. How easy would that be if you're a Civil War general then to say at 652 we launched the attack or the attack ended? Uh, Maybe it lasted five minutes. Maybe it lasted 30 minutes. I don't know. Um, Also, things 
blend together. I, I got an example of that driving back from Winchester last week. I got to witness a, a wreck on 340 just before you get to Harper's Ferry. Congratulations. Yeah, it was, I mean, nobody was hurt, so it was cool. Oh, good. Okay. You know, everybody was fine. But then I had to fill out a police report. Ah. So I'm writing about it, and I had witnessed that just 15 minutes before. And I'd ask, what do I put down for time? Because I don't know what time it happened. And they said, I'll just put general time. And I'm like, okay, like basically when you're filling out the report. Yeah. And then I was like, what did I actually see? And I witnessed it just not even 30 minutes before. Right. And I was having a hard time filling out that police report to make sure I got it right. Nobody's writing 15 minutes after that firefight what happened. No. They're writing in the days, weeks, months, or years after. Or decades. And also keep in mind, the other guy that wrote a report, I'm sure if you held our report side by side, they're different. Oh, yeah. We witnessed the same event. Yeah. They're two different interpretations. Yeah. So that's the challenge. I, I often tell people, don't get stuck up on times. They didn't know. Uh, try to use basic math, and you know how fast these units move. We know when these u- units are roughly in certain areas. Use that as your guide to then kind of work through the timing. But if a soldier says 4 o'clock, another soldier might say 4.30, another soldier might say 5.15. Mm-hmm. So late afternoon is what we can be confident in saying. Basically, they they receive their orders around two thirty, somewhere in that ballpark. Where whether or not it was two twenty three or two thirty seven, I do not know, but somewhere in that ballpark. Right. So, and then they're done with that fighting totally by by three thirty. Um, so right. less, you know, an hour or so. Start total. All right. Uh, Billy Godwin, he says, after the casualties of the 26th and the rest of Heath's division took on July 1st, why did Lee find it necessary to put them back in the line on the 3rd? So we kind of touched on that before. Or did I already ask this one? No, I well, didn't. It's a different one. What we get for most of July 2nd, if you look at, and unfortunately for a lot of maps, they don't extend all the way out on July 2nd mm-hmm. to the ridge to the west. Right. They show what's immediately on Seminary Ridge over to, to Cemetery Ridge. Heath's division is held in reserve on July 2nd. Part of it was the heavy losses there, especially among the 26. Also, Heath had been wounded. Right. Pettigrew is now in command. So they're keeping them in reserve because they're just not ready yet. But by the evening of July 2nd, they then get brought into the middle of the line. They just happen to be in the wrong place, wrong time. Um, You don't want to be in the middle of the line on July 3rd on Seminary Ridge. Right. Because you're probably going to get pulled into the attack. So it's. And Lee doesn't have, uh, you know, dozens of divisions in reserve. Like, it's pretty. Pickett is the only one. And they're being brought up. Right. I mean, you think about the Army of the Potomac has reserves here. Right. Lee doesn't. If you want to count Edward Thomas as his reserve, well, yeah, what <laughs> but that's about it, right? I mean, right. you know, these are your your hard press. I mean, you can find plenty of brigades in the Union Army here that don't really see a lot of action. You're hard pressed to find Confederate brigades that do not see a lot of action. Also, that's a disparity in numbers. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you got a ninety three thousand man army as opposed to seventy five thousand man, and also this is also an army that has suffered heavy losses on July first as well as July second. You're using whatever you got at this point. Yeah. So I don't think it was, you know, I'm sure if Lee could have looked at him and said, if I could find somebody else, he would have. I mean, Lee's not an idiot. Right, of course. And and but sometimes, you know, your fate on a battlefield is depending on where you are and when. And unfortunately the twenty sixth North Carolina found themselves in the middle of Seminary Ridge on July third. Yeah. A uh, fan of both shows, Wild Bill Etzcorn says, is there any way to hey, determine... see, that's possible, folks. <laughs> you can do it. I you know. can like things. I've heard from a few of these people, and I know they listen to both, so it's more than one guy, but I know for sure Wild Bill. Uh, is there any way to determine who inflicted more casualties on the 26th, the 24th Michigan, or the 151st Pennsylvania? Taking nothing away from the 151st Pennsylvania, and I know Bill has a lot of connections to yes. that regiment. Yeah, uh, it's the 24th Michigan. Yeah. just the, just the length of time of action. Now, the 151st Pennsylvania most likely severely wounds the Lieutenant Colonel of 26 North Carolina John Lane. Well, there you go, Bill. Um, so they're most likely the ones that fire that shot, um, and certainly they put up a a stout resistance. But their job wasn't also to stand there all day. Yeah. <laughs> They're doing a rear guard action. You get in, you do what you have to do, and then you get out there as quick as you right, can. Right. So, but that takes nothing away from the 151st, who I also want to note, their term of enlistment was up at the end of July. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to take a three-year regiment or, or in duration of the war and have you do this. It's another thing when you know, you're going home at the end of the month 
do you really want to do this? Yeah. No, I don't. You know, if it was me and it was my last month, I'm putting a bubble around myself. No offense. <laughs> so, um, but I'm putting a bubble around myself until I get out of service. So. <laughs> I got just very quickly. That was an inside joke. The no offense thing there, because we were joking that with all the injuries, we need to get Mike Lentz one of those um, uh, hamster balls so that when we go around the battlefield, he can just walk around in that and uh, well, see, actually, not get I think hurt. Needed to be a little more flexible. <laughs> So yeah. You got to think about if it's a hamster ball, that's hard plastic. Yeah. Right. You're bumping into hard plastic. You mm-hmm. want to have a little bit of... You know, well, no, we already... We, we talked about that, too. Uh, I, I didn't, we, I didn't tell you this. this yet? Me and Mike Bariski were talking about it today even further is... Uh, no, no, no. It was me and Colby. Sorry. We have to get you, like, knee pads and elbow pads and a helmet because <laughs> if you trip and fall in the ball... Right. Like, yeah. let's say in the scenario that you said to me yesterday, Mike, uh, a gust of wind comes and blows you down, let's say, Wheatfield Road, <laughs> and we got to go chase an after you. Yeah. Well, that wind is blowing you pretty fast. You're going to fall. You can't we keep up with that. Some kind of anchor system. Oh, ooh. you're going to need May- some kind of be able to brace yourself. Kind of like the like storm chaser vans. Yeah. Like how they just like <laughs> doosh down the ground. Right. That's pretty cool. Well, someone. Yeah, I think um, basically dresses a hockey goalie inside a hamster. <laughs> exactly. Ball. And you're fine. That's, that's exactly right. So that's exactly solved right. Problems. <laughs> Back to the 26 North Carolina. Okay. So, so that was uh, Bill Letzcorn's question there. Thank oh, you. my God. I love Bill Letzcorn. All right. And then uh, moving on to Tim D. Tim says, did the 26 North Carolina suffer from the same desertion problems that other North Carolina regiments did? Why or why not? Well, one of the things I looked at with the 26 North Carolina was their desertion patterns throughout the war. And what you see is the highest desertion was really that period from February to April 1865, which... That's the same for any Confederate regiment. Uh, But what you see is actually around 40 men of the 26th North Carolina go AWOL or desert between leaving roughly Hamilton's Crossing near Fredericksburg and here on July 1st. Hmm. So they are losing guys. Now, why do they do that? There's any number of reasons. There's, I think, desertion is driven more sociologically than it is politically or your feelings about the war. Go, Go into that. So... If you are, most of the soldiers that enlisted in the 26th North Carolina in 1861 are young, unattached. Mm. Those are the ones you want fighting your war. Right. By the time you get into 1862, 1863, when you have Confederate conscription, you get a situation where, well, I don't want to, I'm sympathetic, but I also got a farm. I got kids. I got, I got to do this. I can't go be a soldier. Well, what happens when you're, you get a letter from home saying that the corn crop is not doing what we need to do, mm. the kids are hungry, what are you going to do? Well, how do you make that decision? Yeah. What's the right call? I would actually argue I'm not going to fault them either way. If you want to stay in the ranks, good on you. If you want to go home, I get that too. Sure. Um, because we forget these are not professional soldiers. These are two years removed from being farmers and shopkeepers right they're different than what we would see today so so we look at that there's any number of factors i think there's also the worry up to this point 26 has been in eastern north carolina southeastern virginia it hasn't been that tough of service and now if you're the army in northern virginia you know what happens when the army in northern virginia goes into a battle Hmm. it's going to be rough yeah and taking aside fredericksburg Look at the numbers of Lee's army in the seven days. He suffers horrible casualties. Hmm. Look at what he loses in casualties at Chancellorsville, his greatest victory. Right, right. Uh, so it was like 22% yeah, of the army. I mean, these are, so they know. Yeah. I mean, when you're now part of this army, you know there's a chance we're going to see hard fighting. <laughs> you know, some people handle that better than others. So there's, and unfortunately, we don't have exit interviews with these guys that are deserting. <laughs> right. I would love that. I would oh, love that would before be great. they leave, like, why are you leaving? Right. You know, it's like when you like, you know, you cancel a service. Why are you leaving? Well, any yeah. number of reasons. Yeah, you suck. We don't get that. So what we have to look at is more their their backgrounds, what might explain this. But we will never know totally hundred percent why, but I think we can get some sense. But the twenty six does suffer from desertion issues after Gettysburg. As well as before. They actually lose more men to desertion before Gettysburg than they do after, which I think is very interesting. Now, I've not, you know, there is an idea of North Carolina, you know. Well, there's not many left after yeah, Gettysburg. Yeah, so that helps, too, um, I guess, the rate. But, <laughs> it's like but if anybody's going to leave, now's the time to leave. Sure. And so what we see is, you know, over time, desertion is also about opportunity. Mm-hmm. If you're a soldier from Texas, are you really going to desert? 
No, where do you go? And you're in Virginia? Right. You know, that, where do you go? But if you're from North Carolina and you're in the mountains, we forget, how does Lee get to Pennsylvania? He crosses the Blue Ridge Mountains. Well, if you follow the Blue Ridge Mountains to the southwest, guess where you run into? North Carolina. The state of North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. So if you're also a kid from the mountains, that's perfect. This is my chance to get away. Right. Uh, so you, you have to look at the state they're from. You have to look at the conditions. So And also, we have to not immediately assume that desertion equals opposition to the war. Right. And I think I remember reading <clears throat> that uh, the, during the Antietam campaign um, that he had a, Lee had a high desertion mm-hmm. rate. And the main reason was that guys were like, well, I fought to defend, not to invade. Mm-hmm. Um, do we find that a lot in the Gettysburg campaign? I, I tend to think that's a l- little overblown of Antietam. Uh-huh. I think uh, what we forget by Antietam, Lee's army is worn out. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have imagine you're in the Stonewall Brigade. You have started fighting in March of 1862 at Kernstown. You go through the Valley Campaign. You immediately roll into the Seven Days, which isn't Jackson's greatest performance, but you're still there. These guys are then at Second Manassas. Mm. They're then at Antietam. They're worn out. Right. These guys don't have shoes. They don't have equipment. They're hungry. Northern Virginia has nothing for these armies. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, is it a combination of I don't want to go into Maryland? That sure sounds a lot better than my feet hurt and I'm hungry. Yeah, yeah. And so we have to factor that in, too. And so, as I say, is there some of that? I'm sure. I'm sure there are people that of principle don't want to do this. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I tend to kind of discount that more and just the condition of the Army more so than any statement on anything. Because there's plenty of, of examples of Confederates coming into Pennsylvania that wanted retribution against the North. Mm-hmm. Why didn't they want retribution in 1862? Well, I don't know. So, you know, it's so I think we have to kind of look at each campaign's different, but I think a lot of it has more to do with the condition of Lee's did, army. Did the northern um, attitude towards uh, destruction of property and all that stuff or confiscation of property or looting or whatever you want to call it, did it get worse after Antietam? Yes. Okay. So then maybe yeah, that's why they wanted up. retribution yeah. now. Yeah. And, and or I up think here. too, I mean, Lee complains about stragglers in his army. D.H. Hill talks about stragglers in his army. Um, so, yeah, I think it's more straggling the condition of Lee's army right. than anything else. And I would argue if you're Lee after the Battle of Chantilly or Ox Hill for my southern friends, <laughs> where today it's a strip mall. Yeah. Um, so sad. So, you know, there's a mattress warehouse where Juba Early's brigade was. <laughs> um, so if you're kind of into that thing, there you go. But you look at that, and if you're Lee, where do you go? You don't go back to Virginia. All right. You want to push. You want to get that one, you're basically swinging for the fences. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's a combination of things, but I think it's mostly conditional Lee's army than anything else. And, and that's a good point, though, because as we learned in uh, an environmental history of the Civil War, uh, the boys going up uh, to Sharpsburg were uh, riddled with dysentery mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, just diarrhea in general. Um, and well, there's diarrhea. Right. And then there's dysentery. Right. right. Like, that's why I made nobody that Nobody in Oregon Trail dies of diarrhea. <laughs> Okay, they die of dysentery. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, yeah, and I would like to say, I often describe it as the worst, like, stomach flu you've ever had in your life, but I Are think you, that's underselling it. Have you had dysentery? I've never had dysentery, okay. thankfully. Yeah, if I ever sounds do, bad. If I ever do, I'll report back. Thank you. Um, if I survive. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, who knows if I get across the Missouri River? I think it was, <laughs> so, We'll see. <laughs> but my oxen, man, they're, they're pains in the ass. <laughs> You know, I was watching 1883. Did you ever see 1883? Oh, my my clock stops at 1865. Oh, okay. Well, it's a good show, and it's a wagon train and mm-hmm. everything. But there were certain things where I was like, did this writer grow up on Oregon Trail? Because like, th- yeah. there's a snake bite. Remember the snake bite? The people get bit by the snakes, and there might have been dysentery. I, I might have missed that. But, but anyway, you know, I mean, you look at that. They're not eating. I mean, you think about on campaign. Well, that's what I'm. These guys are getting typically three days rations. Right now. The worst thing you can ever do is go grocery shopping while hungry. Right. I do that all the so time. So imagine if you're a soldier and you've been marching. I mean, you're carrying roughly 50 pounds of gear. You're tired. You're expending a tremendous amount of calories. And you all of a sudden get all this food. You're not going to ration it out. Hell no. And so what you do is you eat all of it or most of it. And then you get into day two or three and you got nothing left. Right. And also keep in mind the food they were eating is not what you need to eat 
while you have dysentery. Right. And so it was just food that made you feel not hungry. Yeah. I a couple of years ago I was in the the National Army Museum in London, and they had a really interesting exhibit about how did you feed our British armies in different times. And it's estimated a soldier in combat conditions needs upwards of five thousand calories a day. Yeah. You're not getting 5,000 calories out of salt pork, folks. No. <laughs> You're not getting it out of whatever you can find. And um, so, and also there's issues of, you know, vitamin absorption and any number of things for these guys that are, that are effective. If your stomach's messed up, you're not absorbing things. Well, and that's and, the point of, uh, in, in environmental history, you know, they talk about how these guys, as they're walking along the road, there's corn it's not yet ready for mm-hmm. prime time and they would just grab it and mm-hmm. you know shuck it and eat it while they're while they're going and then shortly thereafter you would see a trail of green grass because they had diarrhea yeah and and so like when you're starving which is what they were mm-hmm. um you you know fruits or vegetables are not what you want to put in your body right away and in many ways they're already malnourished Yo, yeah of course I mean, it's not just they're starving they're they're having profound malnourishment even in well in good conditions yes i mean you have and this is not just confederates i mean you have outbreaks of scurvy and other things in union armies right depending on where they are right so yeah i think you know it goes back to it's what they're eating it's the conditions they're in um so that that plays a factor i mean when you have a stomach flu you don't want to do anything no no, you don't. And so, There's nothing worse than the stomach issues. All right, last question here. Char- oh, no, I'm sorry. It's not the last question. I forgot we got new ones today. Charles Fuller says, We know that Pettigrew in the 26th joined AP Hill's course just days before the battle, but did AP Hill and Pettigrew have any sort of relationship, either personally or professionally, in previous campaigns? Maybe in the 1862 Peninsula campaign? Curious to see if any past interactions they may have had affected their communication at Gettysburg. Yeah, we kind of discussed it a little bit with with the way Pettigrew had to deal with Hill. Um, mm-hmm. Pettigrew is severely wounded at Seven Pines, which really Seven Pines. Fun fact: Who's the commander of the Confederate Army at Seven Pines? No, uh, what's his face? Uh, <laughs> yeah, what's his face? Right, uh, and we're not talking about Gustavus Smith, who actually gets a run of it after Joseph Johnston gets wounded. Right, right. Um, so there's Johnson, a fun, that's there's what a I was fun trivia question: Who is? Who are the three commanders of what is the Army in Northern Virginia during the Civil War? Everybody forgets Gustavus Woodson Smith. Uh, but so he was between Johnston and Lee. So he was between that. So yeah, he's yeah. the guy that's having a nervous breakdown when Davis and Lee show up. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And Davis okay. essentially looks at Lee and says, "You're up." Uh-huh. And uh, so, so we see is they don't really have a lot of interaction. Action. Um, now they had interaction between Lewis Young, who knew Hill, right? And, and but but also keep in mind the interaction that a staff officer has with a general that he is not on the staff to is different. Mm-hmm. In fact, Joe's you know you know Lewis Young probably dealt more of Hill's staff than he ever did actually AP Hill. Right, right, right. And so we have to keep that in mind that it's not personal relationships. It's you know here is Hill CEO of the Light Division. And then here is Lewis Young on the staff of Dorsey Pender, who commands a brigade. Right. So That's a good way, point. The way they kind of deal with each other. So not a lot of interaction. Um, Pettigrew was known as a very smart, talented individual. They knew that even sure. in his day. Uh, Your reputation as a scholar precedes you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so... I still I always, talk about your grades there with reverence and awe. Well, it's not that hard to get good grades at Carolina. <laughs> Let's just be real. Um, <laughs> so there goes all your listeners in the chapel. Yeah, though. really. <laughs> We've offended everybody. Well, that's what I did. <laughs> all um, right. But no, well, I think you know, yeah. Pettigrew did not have a lot of interaction. And also keep in mind, he's a brigade commander. Hill is a corps commander. Right. There's a buffer of a division commander there. Right. So, so much of, of these battles are the interpersonal relationship between the staffs. And so, Pettigrew would have known Hill. Hill would have known Pettigrew, but they were not friends. They would not have you know, been hanging out with each other. You know, Pettigrew's not going to be telling him great stories of Spain and Sardinia as they're getting ready to you know, go into the battle. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, John DeMario says, can you tell a story? Of a tw- of a twenty six North Carolina soldier killed, not named Henry Bergwin, that you think people should know about. I can give you one hundred eighty three of them because <laughs> including Bergwin, about one hundred eighty four men of the twenty six died as a result of the Battle of Gettysburg. Well, why don't you just stick with so, one? Uh, you know, I think when you look at it, one of my uh, he doesn't die, but it's the wounding of John Lane. 
which is always very captivating. Now, Lane, on July 1st, as he is leading the regiment forward, he's got the colors of the 26 in his hand. This is another reason why I don't think the 24th Michigan made multiple stands. Supposedly, that flag is falling down at a high, at a high rate. Yeah. And yet, Lane is somehow able to go from roughly modern-day Meredith Avenue almost to the edge of Herbst Woods and not get shot. Hmm. That's that's hard for me to imagine. Mm. Also, carrying a huge flag, right? You know, it's not just like one random guy with a sword. And 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 which in which where does he fall in the order of people who uh, picked up the flag? He is the well. He will be the last. So it's next to last. Next to last. Yeah, the last is st- supposedly a Stephen Brewer, a captain from Company E, is the last person to carry the flag that day. Once again, though, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Right. Um, but when Lane is carrying the flag, he's looking behind to give an order. So imagine the back of his head and neck is now facing the 151st Pennsylvania. Uh-huh. A bullet is going to be fired that enters the back of his neck, avoids his spine, but goes up through his jaw, tears out part of that, tears out part of his teeth, a uh, part of his tongue, and then comes out the side of it. If you've ever watched a sporting event where someone gets hit in the face with something, yeah. how much do they bleed? Yeah, oh, a lot. A lot. Uh, William Edwards said that when Lane comes back, he's the bloodiest man I ever saw. Oh, yeah. Another soldier said he just went down like a rag doll. Um, what's remarkable is Lane survives. He survives that wound. That is. So that's pretty remarkable. How old was he? He was in his mid twenties. So a young man too. So he's a young, yeah. Actually, there is not a single field officer in the twenty sixth North Carolina at lieutenant, at colonel, lieutenant colonel, or major that is over thirty years old. Really? So, so it's a young regiment. It's a very, well, yeah, it's very unique. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, in terms of you know the Ashley Muse story I told earlier, um, what's really for me, what really gets me with that is. When he is there with his friend, his messmate, uh, Joseph Fry, he Fr- Fry stays with him. Fry had been wounded in the hand. So it's not uncommon to, for guys that were slightly wounded to be helping out the hospital. Mm-hmm. Because they're not. if you're wounded in the hand, right. you're at the bottom end of when they're going to treat you. Mm-hmm. So you do what you can to help out. He's staying with his friend. And, and he gives a very heartfelt account of those final moments. And he writes this in August of 1863. Is a letter back home, so okay. this isn't like he's remembering it 50 years later. Right. And he says that, you know, Ashley Muse was, was going in and out of consciousness. And occasionally he would just say, you know, did I do my duty this day? Things like that. And, and really what gets me the most is his, supposedly the final words of Ashley Muse was, is my family coming to get me? Hmm. And we know that Ashley Muse is buried somewhere along the Chambersburg Pike. Most likely he is not in Oakwood Cemetery in Raleigh. Most likely he is not in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. He is probably still along the Chambersburg Pike today. And I certainly think of him every time I drive to Chambersburg. Wow. Because you could trace the retreat of Lee's army by the bodies that are buried between here and the Potomac River. That's interesting to think. I didn't even really think about that. But yeah, there's got to be bodies still and, along the And way. you think, too, that's a family that never got any closure. Yeah. Man. They just know their young man came to Gettysburg, and he never came home. Right. Where no grave it? to visit. None no. of that. None of those comforts that we have for ourselves. Uh, Martin Husk says he's got two questions. Uh, after suffering such horrific casualties on day one, are there any uh, accounts of men refusing to fight in the rest of the battle? Not that I'm aware of. All right. Now, oh. could there have been desertions? Sure. But we don't have an account of that. Also, the command structure of the 26th North Carolina is shattered. Mm. They have a temporary adjutant. So he's not really keeping up with that. But I've not found anything. The closest you were going to find is actually the regimental band of the 26th North Carolina, who are composed of Moravians, who are a pacifist sect. So their thought was, we're not going to serve carrying a musket, but we will serve by being a band. Mm. So we get to serve, but we're not. And also, they were never on official Confederate payroll. They were paid out of pocket by the officers. Which becomes a problem in 1864 when it's all new officers and the deal is, well, we have to pay you. Uh, right, right. They right. almost leave, which is a whole other story. That's interesting. But, uh, but what we see is, not that I'm aware of, uh, even then they were told if we had to carry rifles, we would have. But okay. Fortunately, they didn't. All right. And, uh, but not that I'm aware of, not to say it didn't happen, but I don't have any accounts of it. And uh, his second question, at post-war anniversaries of the battle, there are many pictures of veterans of the third day's fighting shaking hands over the stone wall. Were there any such encounters between veterans of the 26th North Carolina and the 24th Michigan? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, we don't have any famous photos over the wall, which 
I always kind of cringe when I see those. Yeah, because well, it's staged. It was not. It was not the Peace Jubilee. Let's just leave it at right. that. Uh, which was its name, actually, yeah. which I think is kind of cool. But what we do see is the Iron Brigade had a large tent at the 1913 reunion. And they do have a guest book of who came. And a number of men of the 26th North Carolina visited them here. Also, if you there is a photo taken in 1913 showing the front of the Iron Brigade's tent. Mm-hmm. And on one of the little signs, it says, Welcome the 26th North Carolina. And, and I've often thought about this. Outside of the men of the 26th North Carolina that went through that, who was the only other group of people that could understand what they went through that day? Right. It's 24th Michigan. Yeah. And I think so both of them somehow were bonded by that horrific experience that I could talk to a guy from Detroit. If I'm a guy from Wilkes County, North Carolina, he knew what we went through because he was on the other side. He, he inflicted it. And <laughs> so I think there is a mutual respect between the two. Yeah. Um, also, John Lane and William McConnell, who becomes head of the Iron Brigade Veterans Association, become very good friends after the war. Isn't that weird? Um, in fact, McConnell and supposedly McConnell shot Lane. Total bunk. I'm not even going to dignify it All with right. a response. There you go. Just McConnell didn't shoot Lane. We'll just leave it at that. But what we see is after the war, McConnell was a pharmaceutical rep, essentially to use a modern term. And he came to Raleigh one day and he said to his old friend, John Lane, hey, I'd like to visit you in Chatham County. John Lane says, sure, come on down. Here go these two guys that supposedly thought the other one shot the other. They get to the Lane house and they ran into a problem they didn't expect. Mrs. Lane, who refused to allow McConnell in the house. Oh. Because she thought that he shot. the guy that wounded her husband. So, you know, what I find is the women in the South are a lot saltier than the men after the war. Yeah. And so that's where I think you do see a bit of a mutual respect. In fact, there was actually plans that McConnell mentioned for a huge Iron Brigade Hall of History like a dome and everything out there. And they want to include a marker to the 26th there to honor their sacrifice. Oh, so, that's nice. You know, it doesn't happen. doesn't come to fruition. We don't get the monument there until 1985. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's... But, but at least we know that that one Confederate monument would have been approved by the guys who fought them. Yes. If, if it had yeah. come while they were all and, still alive. And so I think there's a mutual admiration between the two. Um, and fortunately, we have the, the guest book of the Iron Brigade. Oh, that's cool. So we know who was there and when. That's so, awesome. Because whenever you go anywhere, sign the guest book, folks. Yes, that's what I always do. Not that it matters, because nobody's well, like, Well, it Matt actually who? does, because a lot of historic sites... Their funding is based on how many people walk through the doors. So I would just urge you, whatever oh, I, historic I, yeah. site you go to, sign in their guest book. Yes. Heck, even make Good up point. fake names if you want. Uh, there you go. You know, do what you can because the Michael more, J. Mouse would more, be my name. The more visit, the more listing the visitors they have, the more funding they get. So if you sure. truly want to help a historic site and not spend any money. Just write your name on a freaking piece of paper. It does a world of. No, yeah, that does. I, I mean, it doesn't matter much. That my name is in all these guest books, particularly because I'm not anybody that they would write books hey, about. You know what? But, you yeah. help funding. So yeah, no. Now that I know so that, I go. will. I will continue to do it. Uh, Rob Dalby says I would be interested, and we kind of just touched on this. I would be interested in hearing about the 26 North Carolina Brass Band and the impact they had on the battlefield. Not much. <laughs> Taking nothing away from them, right? Um, and. And there is an account, suppose, that the 26th North Carolina band was playing waltzes and polkas at one point. The problem is we have a lot of accounts from the men of the band. Uh, we have two diaries from men of the band, mm-hmm. Samuel Mickey as well as Junius Lineback. And, excuse me, Julius. See, I've got Junius mm-hmm. Daniels. Yeah, yeah. Julius, Junius, two good names if you're looking for a name for your kid. Either <laughs> one of them is pretty cool. Yeah, pretty uh, but strong. Mostly what we forget, if you're not performing the band, you're helping the surgeons. Right. You're, you're carrying a stretchers. Bearer. You're doing, you're helping them. Um, Julius Lineback talks about during the seven days, he said, I got really good at learning how to hold people down during amputation. <sighs> so as I would say, on the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really impact the battle, but it does, there, there are a few places that I would consider a hell on earth more than a civil war hospital. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what these guys had to experience. So they're maybe a Yoko Ono concert. Well, at least you can laugh at that. <laughs> Couldn't you though? When your ears are bleeding. Well, hmm. I, mean, I guess we could break detainees with that if we wanted to. And <laughs> now, now um, you're talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. So <laughs> you got a purpose now, Yoko. Well, you know, everybody's got to have a purpose, I guess. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
But you know, it's like my parents always told me: everybody makes mistakes. Uh, so, uh, you know. Oh wait, now I look back at that. That doesn't sound like it. Uh, They're talking about you, Blade. Uh, oh crap! Uh, oh, I'm going to put them in a home tomorrow. You know, so when so. I look at you, I'm reminded of the old cliche: everybody so, makes mistakes. You, you, look, you look at the you look at the band, and I think you know: are they out there playing? No, no. But they're carrying wounded. They're they're helping out as best they They've can. They've got the work cut out um, for them. And and also they had a lot more free reign than the average soldier because they were not actually on the ranks. Right. So on the rolls, excuse me. So they can they can kind of come and go as they please. So the, the experience of a band's a little different. It's a pretty right? sweet gig. Except, Except for the whole base, litter bearer thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and holding down amputees. Yeah. Or, or people, patients, whatever. Uh, all right. Now, this is the last one. Daniel Launce, I think is how you say his name. He's, he's a new one here. Um, uh, he says the 26 has a marker on the battlefield 10 paces from the stone wall. Mm-hmm. They claim to have advanced the farthest in the famous charge on day three. The 57th Virginia, along with the 11th Mississippi, argue to the contrary. What do you say? Or what say you is what he says. Nobody had a tape measure on July 3rd, but everyone was using one after. Yeah. And I'm not talking about distance to the wall. Um, so, <laughs> so what you look at, all right, let's kind of break this down from the very start. Who gets the furthest? I don't know. Um, does the 26 make it up to the wall? Yes. Did they get a couple inches further than the 11th Mississippi? Maybe, maybe not. Did they get further than the Virginians of Armistead's brigade? Yes, uh-huh. we know that. Right. And, and what you see after the war, and actually during the war, there is a strong rivalry between North Carolina and Virginia. <clears throat> Part of it, which is the major, well, lack of a better term, media center of the Confederacy. Right. It's Richmond. Yeah. So if you think about a local newspaper, who do they report on? They report on the boys from they're, home. They're boys, yeah. You know, and so part of that, a lot of the newspapers kind of would get sent around and those stories keep recirculating. And... So that already begins. There's already a rivalry. North Carolina's had issues of not getting enough credit, not enough officers being promoted. Zeb Vance is certainly writing that quite a bit as governor, saying there's not enough North Carolinians in high rank, which I think there's a point to be made Mm -hmm. there. Uh, But you see then after the war, Walter Taylor, who was on Lee's staff, is going to later write that if only the North Carolinians had supported us, we would have been successful. And this is when the North Carolinians go... Wait a minute, you said what? (laughs) So, actually, the Raleigh News and Observer commits an entire issue to publish North Carolina soldier accounts that were in Pickett's Charge. Oh, cool. Just to refute it. Of course, the battle is still lost. I mean, why do we call it Pickett's Charge? Mm -hmm. Um, Although, I did find a monument on the battlefield that I'm using a new term. Some Union veterans on one of their monuments referred to it as Pickett's Repulse. So I like that because I get to use picket, but it's in a negative context. Right, so it's right. Like a backhanded slap at Virginia. <laughs> so from now on, kids, the cool name is Pickett's Repulse. Only losers call it Pickett's Charge. So, <laughs> there you go. Uh, don't be a loser. So, in all, but in all seriousness, I okay. don't know who got the furthest. Uh, North Carolina's monument is put there in the late '80s. It's in the wrong location. It doesn't need to be there. It needs to be actually further up, about 220 yards, where the 12th New Jersey is. That's who actually captured the 26th flag. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 11th Mississippi, obviously, that gets put in. But if you look at it, North Carolina is clearly in front of the Armistead wounding marker. If you then look at where the Mississippi Monument is, they're just a couple inches closer yeah. to where the 26 was. Right. So, you know, I've joked for long term, I'm just going to take a skid loader out and move the 26 <laughs> and put it in the right location and just put it like a half inch closer uh-huh. than the 11th Mississippi. Right. I'm put it right beside it, <laughs> too. Um, so, you but know, take as far, that Trent Lott. As far, <laughs> as far as getting <laughs> over the wall... Mm-hmm. Armistead's men are the only ones that did that. It wasn't the, I, right. well, I, unless they were being taken prisoner. And they were. Too. <laughs> um, well, the 26, you know, there, there's a great account supposedly after that from a guy in the 12th New Jersey that said as the 26 comes up, they stop their firing. Shelby Foote does a version of this in Ken Burns' Civil War. They say, you know, reach out their hand, come over on this side of the Lord. Yeah. I've gone through a lot of accounts of the 12th New Jersey. I have not found any contemporary evidence to support that. One account I do have from a soldier in the 12th New Jersey describes the attack on July 3rd as the enemy came up to our lines, but only to die. It's a good one. So uh, John Jones, who was in command of the 26th on July 3rd, will note that they got right up to the wall, hmm. which is still pretty remarkable. That's pretty good, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and all they had to wait for them is buck and ball from the men of the 12th New Jersey. So. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. 
Well, uh, Eric, this was uh, a lot There's of fun. The time. I, we know, generally. Relax. And, uh, well, I thought that was President Bartlett. No, no, no. That's generally. There is no time. Okay, relax. God, we have gone uh, to three hours here. So you and Jim both <laughs> have like three hours. I have told you there is no time for that. Lee. Go there to the is bathroom. no time. <laughs> go to the bathroom. <laughs> go to the bathroom, General Lee. You're angry. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Eric, for no coming problem. and doing this. This is a lot of fun. Well, Battle of Gettysburg podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, you can always, you know how to get a hold of Eric, I'm sure, if you want to take a tour with him. But if you don't, you can email me, Matt, at Addressing Gettysburg, and I'll put you in touch with him if you want to take a tour with him. Uh, Eric, the producer, thank you very much. Michael Lentz, thank you for your two cents. Oh, that rhymed. And I didn't mean to do that. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next time. Uh, <laughs> My ears are ringing. So we've talked longer about the 26 than it, they actually spent fighting. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Need a core badge or other insignia for your uniform? Then check out the badge maker. Here's what some of his satisfied customers had to say. Miranda said, I ordered an identification disc from Joe and it's fantastic. He hand stamped it exactly as I wanted. Greg said, my unit has purchased from him in the past quality badges and good service. And Jerry S. says, the badge maker is the go-to place for accurate replica Civil War badges. So go to CivilWarCoreBadges.com and attach a message with your order saying you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg. Our hearts so stout have got us in For soon tis known from whence we came Wherever we go they dread the name Of Gary Owen in glory Instead of spot we'll drink down And we'll pay the reckoning on the nail No man forget shall go to jail From Gary Owen in glory Instead of spot we'll drink down